Today on Detroit Muscle, the boys take a trip back to the 80s with not one but two new project cars. There's lots to be done with renderings being made along with a custom chassis. Hey y'all, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Now we've been making some pretty good progress on our 69 Charger, but we're just like everybody else out there. We'll start a couple of projects before our old one is even halfway done. Now we're fixing to jump into an area that's not really known for the big power of muscle whenever it comes to the you know automotive side of things. Let's say it's more known for its big hair and a few bad decisions. And you know how bad decisions go. Typically where there's one, there's another one right behind it. And that's the case for me and Tommy here because we are gluttons for punishment. Well, we've decided to take on both of these 80s ladies at the same time. First up is this super clean 1985 Buick Regal. And this one is gonna be my ride. Up under here, we've got 3.8 liters of tire shredding madness. Not really. However, this little V6 does get pretty good fuel mileage and is reliable, but it doesn't make the power that we're looking for. Now, you guys remember Buick did make a V6 that made some really good power, but it had a big turbo hanging on it. We're not really gonna go that route, but you guys are gonna have to stay tuned to see what we do. Next is this dirty girl right here, an 81 Cobra. Nice. Well, you may think that Buick is fancy, but it's not a 1981 Ford Mustang Cobra. This thing's got something on that old Buick. Well, two things actually, two more cylinders. This is a V8, but I don't really want to talk about the power output because let's just say it didn't come from the golden age of high performance Mustangs. We're having a little bit of a build off with these hairband honeys, and the plan is to go a couple different ways with them. With both of these projects, we got a long way to go. Mr. Mark, on yours, what's your plans for that big Mustang? What do you think they are? 347, bigs and littles on the wheels and tires, big stupid tack on the dash, maybe some black paint, growing your hair long in the back and pulling the sleeves out of your shirts. Mm, you might have hit a couple of them, but I'm not gonna tell you which one. So, what about the Buick, Grandpa? Well, you know we're gonna have to get some of that grandma scent out of the inside, so we're gonna have to, you know, fix the interior up a bit, and then we're gonna have to address this paint as oh, well. Oh, candy paint. No, not candy paint. We're gonna have to also fix the wheels, because these things being- 26s. No, just bigger wheels, not huge wheels. And then we're gonna put some power under the hood, because this little motor ain't gonna do it. Oh yeah, single turbo. Yo, Grand National clone. I got no, it. no. We may pull a few of those accessories off of a Grand National, if you will, and put them on this, because it's hard to beat a Grand National. But let's say, let's go grab a cheeseburger and enjoy driving them for a bit before we tear them apart. All right, well, if my tires hold air. You can ride with me if you want to, if they have a flat. You know, at least you'll be comfortable in this one. Oh, this is comfy. Oh, this is nice. Pillow top seat. When it comes to 80s cars, to me, there's nothing better than a Fox Body Mustang. I mean, I am kind of partial to Fords. I grew up in a Ford family, and my mom always drove a Mustang, sure, but I just think that the Fox Body is the quintessential 80s car. Few of you guys maybe wonder why would someone want to pick a grandma car like this one? Well, it's actually because these things are getting really popular. And back in the 80s, well, the Grand National, which is the brother, I guess you would say, of this little Regal, well, was the fastest production car of that era. You can't find another car that has more aftermarket support than this. Maybe a Jeep, but certainly not in the muscle car market. Is there anything out there like the parts available for the Fox Body? Quite frankly, I just want to be a little bit different. That Fox Body Mustang, well, it's going to be really hard to stand out if you're going to build one of those timing behind me. I'll show him what's up. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Ooh, you feel that shift? Even the power shift is comfortable. That shows what kind of power this thing makes. Now, right now, we just reached 65 miles an hour and now uh, it shifted in the drive. Yeah. See that also steered this car with my finger. Mmm. Glad y'all made your way back. Now, oftentimes, whenever you start a project and you start telling your buddies about it, well, sometimes it can be a little difficult for them to understand the direction of your build. One of the easiest ways to tell the story is to contact an artist and have them fix you up with a rendering. This is the one that we had done for our Buick. I've been working with Carter Hickman at Carter Hickman Designs and he came up with this gorgeous concept for our Buick project. He used a photorealistic approach and hit it with a great looking burgundy paint scheme along with some black accents. Top it all off with those modern wheels and that aggressive stance and you've got one mean regal. Welcome to Grant, Alabama. Southeast of Huntsville, it sports a booming population of 907 people. It was comfy. This thing does ride nice. Why you want to mess with it? It's a perfect grandma car the way it is. <laughs> hey y'all, welcome back. Now the first step to our Buick build involved us taking a little road trip down here to this great town of Grand Alabama. And we all know that Tommy and this Buick here can use all the help we can give them. So we figured we'd give Tommy a head start here at Street Rod Garage so this thing can get an updated undercarriage. Here at Street Rod Garage, we specialize in building custom chassis for muscle cars, street rods, hot rods, and just about anything else. Everything is done in-house. We design them, test, do all the CAD work, engineering, everything's done in-house. Now the first step is we gotta get this car on the lift so that we can start developing that chassis. That's good. The reason we gotta do this is because they haven't developed the chassis for a G-Body yet. So what you gonna do under here? Well, now that we've got it on the lift, we will, we will go through the entire chassis front to back and we will map the entire chassis. We'll go through start to finish. We'll take our dimensions all the way through step by step. Uh, once we get all that plugged into the computer, then we will start working our transitions where it transitions in here, where it transitions there. If we're running a wider tire, if we're gonna do a modified rear a lot of times it depends on what the customer wants and what they want to do. A lot of times in a, a real complicated independent or something like that, you have to modify the car to make that happen. If we have a customer, like in this instance, we don't want to cut this car up, we're going to use something that we know will fit. We're going to use a, a modified triangulated four link, a parallel four link, um, maybe a torque arm set up or something like that that's going to fit under the original body without having to cut the floor from the car. Now comes the meticulous part. Chris has to measure a series of key points all along the underside of the car using a laser and a ruler and translate those measurements to a paper template. All right, the next step is we'll take all the notes that we've taken. We'll go back to the computer and we start plugging all these numbers in and start actually drawing the perimeter of the frame. Once we get all that in, we've got our frame perimeter designed. We're ready to start doing the transitions and all that. And then we will carry that over onto this system where we're ready to cut parts. We'll start cutting the parts and pieces to build a frame on the CNC plasma table. Uh, all those parts will then go out, be cleaned up, ready to set the jig. And then uh, we try to get to the point where we've got a perimeter frame that we can test under the car and then that's the point where you start doing suspension. Well, I know it's gonna take a few weeks for you guys to fab up a big killer chassis, so I guess you'll be in touch, right? Yeah, we'll be in touch, a few weeks. Cool, well, this is where I'm supposed to inject like an insult to this guy for driving a Mustang, but I just did. You ready to go? After you, this way I'll let you, you know, be ahead of me for once. Hey folks, thanks for joining us. In case you haven't noticed, I'm on a bit of a road trip. 
We've got a few stops to make today because I'm on the hunt for some seed upgrades for my mid-80s Buick Regal project. All three places we need to go are here in northern Alabama, so that's going to make it pretty easy. The first stop we've got to make we found whenever we were coming back from the Street Ride Garage guys, and it's what's called the Fiero Factory. Now they had those little cars sitting around for days, and I'm hoping they have just what we need. You might be wondering, why go to a Fiero graveyard when you're building a Buick? Well, here's the short version. I've been told that Fiero seats will bolt right onto the tracks that go into one of those mid-80s Buicks. And these seats are much sportier than the factory ones we have. Well, with that done, we're pretty much ready to move on to our next stop, and that's going to be Street Ride Garage. We're going to see what the status of the Buick and how much progress they've made. And while we're there, we're going to go ahead and pull out the Buick seats. That way, you know, we can start making progress with the interior on it. From here, it's a pretty short hop down to Grand Alabama, where our Buick is. We'll get to work getting the seats out, and that includes the back ones as well. Now while I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead and grab the door panels and the rear panel because I wanna upgrade it as well as the seats. This wood grain is in really nice shape, but it kinda has that old person feel to it. We can do something there, I'm sure. Man, I appreciate you helping us get this stuff out. We'll come back and see you whenever the chassis's done if you'll give us All a right. call. All right, no problem. All right, bud, see Thanks. you. Well, we're making some pretty good time, and since we're in the area, we're gonna stop by and see some friends of mine, Wayne and Pamela from M&M Interiors. These guys do some spectacular work, so let's just check them out and see what cool stuff they got going on. Hey y'all, how you doing? What are you doing way off down here? Well, we slipped out for a little bit, but I got some interior stuff that I'm needing, I guess, addressed, and didn't know if you guys might could help me out with it. We'll take a look at it and see what you got. All right, I'll bring it in then. All I don't right. wanna put sounds you like out a, too much. Sounds like a plan. Well, here's the door panels, and I was hoping we could do something to kind of get rid of this maw maw wood grain, if you will. Oh yeah, yeah, that's not any problem to do away with that. Just got some nuts on the backside, and kind of, yeah, modern it up a little bit. Yeah, we're kind of going with like a pro touring kind of feel to it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not going to be like a machined out car, kind of a street driven type deal, but mm -hmm. you know, I want it to have that that vibe, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that kind of more performance oriented vibe than, than the grandma wood grain. <laughs> Absolutely. Not a problem. Can we get rid of this chia pit stuff down there at oh, the bottom? Yeah. yeah, the fake fur's got to go. We can, we can just pull that stuff right off and uh, make some kind of cool insert to fit in there to tie everything together and and a little bit of work and make it make it look real good. All right, well, let me grab the seats and we can talk about that. All right, sounds good. M&M Hot Rod Interiors is a great place to go if you're looking to get either an interior restoration done or to get one customized like we are. Now, you can look at this little jewel here and you can tell that it's a product of the 80s with that big pillow top seat. Oh, yeah. And I'm not really a big fan of it, so if we could get away from that, it'd be a good thing. Yeah, I think so. You gotta get away from grandma's seat for a pro touring car. Now this seat here come out of a Fiero. Do you think it's something that we can work with? Yeah, absolutely. We've done these for years in street rods and muscle cars. They they fit good, they look good. They have the look of a high-end aftermarket seat at a fraction of the cost. Mm. 
Now with the pro touring things, oftentimes you see it's got a bunch of different colors and textures and mm -hmm. materials. Is that something you can handle? Yeah, I think so. We can uh, probably do some heavy contrast stitching on the sides and uh, maybe some kind of cool cloth insert to give it that more modern muscle car look. So yeah, not a problem. Now on some of the research that I've seen that you can take the seat tracks off of this one and bolt to the bottom of that and it's practically a bolt-in swap. Do you mm -hmm. mind if we try that? Yeah, just throw it up here, Tommy. We'll see if we can get those tracks off. I think it'll work. I believe it'll work. Well, I'm actually surprised that this worked as easy as it did. I am too. Usually it never does, but this is going to be a lot better than working on grandma's seats. So can I come back and see you in a few weeks or so? Absolutely. We'll take care of it. All right then. Today on Detroit Muscle, Tommy and Mark give us an update on the projects that we have in the shop. Plus, we get to work getting Project Street Regal onto its new chassis. Hey y'all, welcome to Detroit Muscle. I'm Tommy Boschers. And I'm Mark Christ. And in case this is your first time tuning in, here's what we're all about. We like anything that's cool or fast, whether it be classic muscle or late model performance. We do everything from salvation to restoration, with one thing in mind, making them look good and run like hell. And we always find a way to weave in the one thing that's more important than all that. Having a real good time. The three project cars that we're working on here in the shop are from the big three. We've got a Ford, a GM, and a Mopar. They're all at different stages of the build and with completely different attitudes. The apple of our eye would have to be this 69 Dodge Charger. You can't get much higher up in the food chain of the muscle car world than one of these. Now, whenever we picked up Project Hard Charger, it was nowhere near this suite. You could say it was in the knee of a little bit of TLC. We're going with big power, big brakes, big wheels, and big fun. So in days to come, keep watching and see Project Hard Charger come to life. But that's not the only project we have. We've got a couple of 80s ladies we're going to tell you about, so stick around. Don't go away. We'll give you the inside scoop on what's in store for our 80s model projects that Tommy and Mark are building for their friendly head-to-head -head competition. Hey y'all, welcome back. The next subject for discussion is these two rides right here. Now I know they don't look like much, but that one right there, well, we really haven't done nothing to it. And that one over there, it's kind of supposed to look that way. And before we started on both of these 80s cars, they were both pretty much stock and definitely slow. When we first picked them up, we decided it would be a cool idea to do a little build off. A friendly competition, if you will. And even though they have similar styling, they couldn't be much more different. One's a Ford, one's a GM. One is a unibody, and one has a full frame. One's pretty sporty. Tommy's behind me. I'll show him what's up. And the other one? Oh yeah. Ooh, did you feel that shift? Even the power shift is comfortable. That shows you what kind of power this thing makes. Well, it's kind of a luxury car. My plans for this thing is to add some modern conveniences with some strong power. Let's say fuel injection, automatic transmission, big brakes, some fancy wheels, and some pretty paint. Kind of a pro touring theme with a luxury feel to it. Pro luxury, if you know what I mean. And quite the opposite is what I wanted for my baby. This 81 Mustang Cobra. Raw power with a carb, a five-speed manual gearbox, and several touches that some might say are a little rough around the edges. Coming up, we get to work turning Grandma's grocery getter into a pro touring beast. Hey, y'all. Glad you made your way back. Now, old Mark's been talking quite a bit of smack about my old Buick back here. And that's all swell and good, because you know he's putting a lot of work into that ride of his. But you know what he's going to have when he's all said and done? 
a old fox body Mustang. So let me give you the inside scoop on my plan. I'm looking to build a refined street car with some grit. It's gonna have modern power, billet wheels, leather interior, some serious suspension, and sweet candy apple paint that make your teeth hurt. To kick off our build, I knew I needed a solid foundation to build off of. So we took a trip to Grand Alabama to Street Ride Garage. These guys have applications for chassis to fit just about everything. And if they don't have one to fit your ride, well, they'll design one. That was the case in our situation. Here at Street Ride Garage, we specialize in building custom chassis for muscle cars, street rods, hot rods, and just about anything else. So after a bit of sweet talking, we left our Regal with them to use for R&D. This is what they came up with. It's their newest addition in their Evolution Series chassis. A full custom frame that's boxed front to rear with inner and outer gussets for superior strength. They also narrowed the rear rails a bit to help accommodate for wider rear tires. For the front suspension, it's a combination of C5 vet spindles with fabricated tubular upper and lower control arms and rack and pinion steering. They also added a nice solid sway bar for good measure. Out back, we're running a parallel four link with pen hard bar connected to a beefy Mosier nine inch rear axle with a wave track limited slip differential to put the power to the ground. For springs and shocks, all four corners have adjustable QA1 coilovers. That gives us the ability to dial in that ride, whether we're cruising on the streets or making a hot lap at the track. For a power plant, I wanted something that was strong and reliable with fuel injection. So I bet you can guess what I picked, LS Power. This is a 525 horsepower LS3 from Chevrolet Performance. It's part of their connecting cruise line and it does just that. It comes with everything you need to do the install, like harness, pedal, ECU, transmission, and so on. What's really nice about this setup is it comes with all the pieces to the puzzle. So it's a plug and play unit that's ready to go. We're gonna use these plywood wheels so they can move our chassis around here in the shop. We've gotta fit it up under our Buick and then we can measure for some custom wheels. And I bet you old Mark's gonna have something to say about them. Y'all just wait for it. All right, Tommy, I got this old chassis out of here for you. Hard part's done. <laughs> now, after you're getting the old frame out from under there, you can pretty much tell that this thing is nowhere near as strong. It's got C-channel here where that in's box. Got all those gussets. Man, that piece is gonna be nice up under here. Yeah, plus this old thing's gotta go anyway. Might as well just roll the whole thing out. Stay with us. We circle the wagons on our new chassis. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, it's finally time for us to marry the motor and transmission together, and hopefully we can slide that thing onto the chassis and get all of that up under our Buick. Right, come on down. We need to get the engine spreader bar attached using a few bolts. Then we can pick it up off the pallet with our forklift so we can get it into place to mate it to our transmission. Since we're just mocking it up for now, we're not going to install the torque converter. All right, there, let's try that. We'll just secure it with a couple of bolts. All you. Up we go. And maneuver it over so that we can install it onto our new chassis. So excited. Oh, let me get this trans mount on. All right, come on down. Fast? Preferably not. <laughs> I help you steady. Just keep an eye on that. See where those mounts fall up front as I'm moving this back. And when the big moment comes, how's that? Motor oil pan's not going clear. Oh. 
Oil pan's not gonna clear. <laughs> so where we're at right now, we need another oil pan to clear our cross member, which isn't no big deal at all. So we're gonna have to order us one of them. But what we can do is still put this thing up under the car, just see where it's at, because it's about that much too high. And I'm sure all this is still gonna have plenty of clearance. So let's just see where it's at. I wanna see it in that today. We can detach our spreader bar and roll the chassis under the body. I like your wheel choice, Tommy. Are these board Coddingtons? No, no. We'll use a plumb bob to make sure our body mounts are in line with the holes on our new chassis. That's pretty close. Then we can lower the body onto it. We down now. Yep, it's down. Well, I have to admit, Tommy, great engine choice. It looks good in there. Yeah, we still got quite a bit of work to do. We're gonna be enlarging the wheel tubs. Plus, you never know, we may accidentally bolt in one of them fancy power adders. Yeah, you're gonna need it. But all that's gonna have to wait until next time. So until then, go to PowerNationTV.com. Hey guys, welcome back. We've got our Buick on the lift and we're ready to get busy on it. Now the task at hand for today is gonna to be making some room for some big old rear wheels. Now these tires right here are pretty good size and all, but I'm wanting to run even wider than this. And it's not exactly just gonna fit up under there. Let me show you what I mean. To make the room that we're gonna be needing, what we're gonna do is take this wheel tub here and move it inward here on the body. Now sometimes whenever you're doing this type of modification, you'll run into the frame rail. But luckily for us, our chassis guy accommodated us. If you look here in this hole, we've got a couple of inches of room to play with. So what we're gonna do is cut this out, move it in just a bit, and do some trimming, and then weld in a new one. Now to do all that, yeah, it's gonna take some fab work, but it'll be worth it in the end. So let's go ahead and get that one out of the way. I'm gonna start off by making a mark where I need to cut. We're not trying to save this old thing, so we'll cut it into a few pieces. After that, I'll drill some holes so that we can get the cut. The body saw has to be one of my favorite tools. Yeah, it's a bit noisy, but it makes easy work when removing panels like this. Up here on the front, I drilled several holes, and now it's just a matter of connecting the dots. Bam, it's that easy. Now we need to make a few marks so that we can cut our floor. What I'm gonna do is move it all the way in so that it's basically parallel or flush with the side of the frame rail. Now here on the rear of the frame, you've probably noticed that it's kinda got a 90 degree bend in it. The reason they did that is because there's a body bushing under here and they're trying to attach to it. Now what we're gonna do on the front side of that is we want it to be flush with the side of the rail, so we'll mark it just like we did up there. I'm gonna just eyeball this line using the frame as a guide. And then I'll get to spend a little more quality time with that body saw. fill up that big old hole that we just cut in our Buick, what we're gonna be using is a set of these factory style replacement wheel tubs that we got from Summit Racing. Now I could have made something out of flat metal, did a whole bunch of hammering and shaping, but for the style build that we're doing, it's just really not worth it. But what we are gonna do is take this wheel tub, cut this lip off, and then we'll follow that up with a band to connect this inner to the factory outer. I'll make a mark all the way around the new wheel tub and use the line as a guide. When cutting an odd shaped panel like this thing, making a smooth straight cut can be kind of difficult. But with that as a reference, it's much easier. Looks like that's gonna work just fine. Now I still gotta do some grinding so that we can weld this thing up. So I'll go ahead and do that. Y'all don't run off, we'll see you here shortly. Stay with us as Tommy tightens up our tubs. 
Hey guys, glad you made your way back. While you were gone, I went ahead and ground and wire brushed all in here, making preparations for some welding. I also added this little tab through here and right down here on the floor. That way it'll make it a whole lot easier to attach that new piece. And what I used was just a simple piece of sheet metal that I put in the brake and made a 90 degree bend. Now what we need to do is take that wheel tub, fit it in there and see if we need to tweak it any before we weld it into place. With our wheel tub all clamped in place, the next thing we need to do is fill this void here in between the two. And to do that, we're going to use a couple of strips of metal. And it's pretty simple. What we're going to do is take this, slide it under our factory lip and on top of this new wheel tub. We'll slide it around until we get to fit exactly where we want it, attach it with some panel clamps, and then burn it into place. I know this piece looks too big right now, but we'll trim it down later. We'll start by installing several of these panel clamps. They will hold everything together and allow us to shape our filler panel as we go. I like to tap the panel slightly because the vibration helps to tighten up the clamp. We'll put a few more fasteners here on the underside of the fender wheel because the trunk hinge brace is in the way to do it from the top. We can mark our seams. remove the panel clamps and slide out our filler piece. Using a pair of tin snips, I will trim off the excess of our filler panel, cutting it about a half inch from our orange guideline. Now all that's left to do is grind off the black coating on our new wheel tub. That ought to do it. With our panel back in and all trimmed up, now it's time to throw some sparks. I'm not welding the seams completely from top to bottom. I'm going to weld it in half inch increments, trying to keep each weld about an inch apart. Now where this panel is located, you really don't have to worry about giving it too much heat and warping it. Just make sure it's burned in nice and soft. That turned out pretty good and we've got some big gains for a little bit of work. Now I didn't get to address this corner because I'm gonna have to come back and fill in where the spare tire used to go. If you have any questions about what you've seen on today's show, go to PowerNationTV.com. But we're all out of time for now, so until next time, y'all keep it between the ditches. Today on Detroit Muscle, Tommy and Mark fabricate a new bumper for our 85 Buick, Project Street Regal, giving it a more aggressive appearance to go with the theme of our car. Hey folks, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Now we've got the ball rolling again on our Buick Regal project here, and with a full custom chassis underneath, with modern suspension, mini tubs, and LS powertrain, this thing is gonna be a handler. Problem is, it still looks like your grandma's Buick, so we need to make it look the part as well. Now we're gonna have to address the appearance on this thing, like getting rid of some of the bright work that's on it. We're toying with the idea of losing the vinyl top. And you know this color, we're definitely gonna have to do something in that department. But today our main course is gonna be kinda tidying up a trademark of the 1980s, and that is, big chrome bumpers. Now, way back in 1985, somebody's grandmama drove this car home from the dealership and she was real happy with all that chrome. Not to mention these bumperettes here, impact strips, which are showing their age now, which all of that stuff kind of screams luxury and we're going more for a performance look. And we've got it just mocked up for now because we want to make some changes. We want to get rid of all this rubber and black plastic in the bumperettes, but instead of just grinding and welding on this chrome bumper, we've got a better solution. 
And that would be this piece right here that we got from Classic Industries. It's a reproduction bumper for a Grand National because if you remember, they came with painted bumpers. Now we don't have to send it out and have the chrome stripped off of it. Now what we're planning to do is fill in this little recess here that's for the license plate and over here on our turn signal holes. We're also wanting to add some dimples to give it more of a fabricated look. But the first thing that we need to do is kind of figure out how we're going to cut this thing up. We're just eyeballing this because it just has to be larger than the pocket of the turn signal. On the bottom here, we want to line it up with the body line. We use our trusty big old cutoff wheel for the long cuts. And switch to the smaller one for the finer cut. Now we need to make us a template using our old piece and some cardboard. This is kind of like back when I was in kindergarten, enjoying myself. And no, I wasn't one of the kids that eat paste. Well, maybe a little bit. Oh yeah, it's gonna work. You tired of throwing sparks on that Mustang? Hey man, heavier cars bring more for scrap. You know, that would look better if that was made out of metal. Let me, give me that. I'll take it from here. <sighs> well, I've got this piece of eighth inch cold rolled steel that I'm gonna use to make this patch panel. The problem is, I'm gonna have to make a bend in it. Now, it's gonna be difficult for us to do because we don't have a tool here in this shop that'll bend something that thick, so we're gonna have to improvise and make something ourselves. So the difficult part about this is that I have to duplicate this radius here. And what I've found is this piece of tubing here is actually a slightly tighter radius, which will be ideal to bend our metal around. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a break out of the table and use this piece of tubing attached to the edge of it to be the lower jaw of the break. And then what I'm gonna do for the upper jaw is use this piece of tubing here, sandwich the metal in between, clamp it in place, make our bend. I want to make sure this is flush with the top of the table, so I'm going to use these magnets. Then I can burn it in with the Lincoln Electric Power MIG. Well, my tool's ready, but before I make the bend, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to make a cut here next to where my template is because I don't want to bend any more metal than I have to. But instead of just ripping this thing all the way down, which would sacrifice this piece, I'm gonna notch it out down here. Besides, I need as much weight and leverage down there as possible. The bandsaw is ideal for this because it makes nice, clean cuts. Then we'll sandwich the metal in our improvised brake, make sure it's square with the edge of the table, clamp it down tight, and make that bend. All right, I might do it. Well, that tool worked out just fine and it made it a lot easier. Now our bin's done, that's the hardest part. Just need to get it cut out now, weld it in place. And we can move on to the other side. Coming up, Tommy puts the finishing touches on our custom Buick bumper, making it fit the theme of our build. Hey folks, welcome back. While you were gone, I got that piece cut out, welded in, and got all those welds ground down nice and smooth. Did the same on the other side and while I was at it, Filled all these holes that were here for that impact strip to mount to. I'm going to hand it off to Tommy here, and I'm going to go get some fresh air. What we're going to do now is remove this little recess here in the middle of the bumper. It isn't going to be all that complicated. We're going to use the steps that Mark showed you earlier. First thing we need to do is make some marks and throw some sparks. We're going to use the same method that we used earlier, following the body lines on the bumper.
Now we're ready to start working on our insert panel. Now to do this, we're not going to be making a cardboard template. What we are going to do is take our piece, start trimming it down using some measurements, but the first thing we need to do is mark center. This is important because there's a peak here in the center and we want to keep that straight. We'll transfer that center mark to our filler piece, mark where the other cuts need to be made, and head to the bandsaw. A quick test fit, we can tack it in. With the rest of the filler pieces made, we'll check their fitment, tack those in, and then weld it up solid. On these welds, we're going to use a blending disc to mow them down and polish it out. We got our bumper all welded up and ground down and it turned out pretty slick. Now the next thing we're going to do is add us some dimpled holes or lightning holes as some people call them. The first step to that process is laying out your pattern. We're going to use this masking tape as our canvas. The next thing we're going to do is draw us a line right through here to help lay out our holes for our dimples. And to do that, I'm going to use the upper side of the bumper as a guide. Our dimple dies work great as a template to mark where we want our most inner hole and outer hole. Then we can use the straight edge to mark the tops of the holes. Now we need to draw some circles, and to do that, we're going to use one of these pattern makers. Our hole is going to be an inch and seven sixteenths, so now all we have to do is line this up with the marks that we made, draw on our circles. Now we're wanting to space our holes an inch and an eighth apart, so I'm going to use the inch and an eighth hole, make a mark, and move on. We'll center punch where we need to drill, make our pilot holes. Then we can use the step bit to finish them off. This process is relatively simple. What we're going to be using is a set of dies to make our dimple holes. And depending on how you stack them onto your panel is going to determine whether you flare them up or flare them down. We want ours to recess in. We'll just put that piece on the top. Line this one up on the bottom, and then put it under here and smash them together. You want to apply just enough pressure to completely compress the dies together. Not so much that you distort or mar the bumper. That gaudy chrome bumper is what we started with. This is what we've got now. Those few hours we spent gave this Buick an attitude adjustment that it desperately needed. Today on Detroit Muscle, Mark dives into Project Sidewinder installing the cooling and fuel systems getting one step closer to hitting the road. Plus, Tommy adds some custom fabrication pieces to the interior of Project Street Regal. Hey folks, welcome to Detroit Muscle. We're busy working on our 85 Buick and 81 Mustang Cobra Project Sidewinder. Now Tommy's out picking up some parts for the Buick, so I'm gonna get started on the Mustang right off the bat. There's a couple of systems that I wanna get wrapped up on this thing today, the fuel being one of them and the cooling. Now I do need to get the car up in the air to get up underneath, get that fuel tank swapped out, but I've got a bunch more stuff under the hood, so I'm gonna start there first. Old Mark's making some pretty good progress on his Mustang and it's time for me to make some here on this Buick. And the subject matter that we're going to be covering all happens here on the inside. What we're wanting to do is jazz it up a bit on the inside of here. Now, you know, a lot of times those sporty and high performance cars have a full console and a power shifter. And our old car being far more on the comfortable side, well, let's guide it up here on the column. So we're going to go a different route. If you were wanting to go down the path of kind of a restored car, there are options for a reproduction like this we got from Classic Industries. But we're wanting to step it up even further than that. And that's where this thing comes in. It's a very aggressive looking horseshoe shifter with some simulated brass knuckles. It's quite a trick piece. 
Whenever you're mounting something like this, there's a few things that you want to keep in mind. One of those is the sweep of the shifter. You don't want to be jamming your knuckles into the dash and you don't want it crammed up into the seat. Another thing is it's got to have a solid foundation. If you're going to be mounting it through the floor with some bolts or something, take a look at the bottom side. There could be some inner structure and scooting it up or back can save you a whole lot of work. Now with what we're planning to do on this thing is lift it up here in the front just to give it that cooler effect, we'll have to build a bracket, but we can handle that. We taped up the side of our shifter because we don't want to damage it while we're making our bracket here. And to make that bracket, we're going to be using some eighth inch material. And I know that may sound a little bit heavy, but we want it plenty strong enough to support this thing. Now here on the base of it, we're going to have to make a few measurements and then we'll transfer that here to the plate and then we can cut everything out. What we're looking for here is a piece that's 9 inches long and 4 inches wide. I'll use a square to keep everything straight. This next piece is going to be the mount that we're going to use to attach to the floor. I'm going to mark off an inch on each side so that we can bend the tabs down and grind those to shape to the floor. Our next pieces will be the mid plate and a couple of wedges. Now a quick trip to the bandsaw so I can whittle all these out. We got all of our pieces cut out and I went ahead and bent the tabs here on our base mount. What we're going to do is lay this up here, take a marker, lay it on top of the transmission tunnel, kind of drag it across. That'll give us a perfect mark to know exactly how much we need to grind down. Once we're done with the bell sander, it's time for assembly. I'll clamp our mid plate to the floor mount, make a few marks, and drill four holes. We'll install these threaded inserts to make installation easier. Then burn all of our pieces together and it's back to the car. When mounting this thing in place, we want to make sure it's level. Then with our adjustments made, we can fuse the two together. turned out all right. Keep it dialed in. Tommy tackles our trunk situation on Project Street Regal. Hey guys, glad you made your way back. We made some pretty good progress up front and now it's time for us to make some back here. What we're going to be doing is filling in this big old hole. This is where, as a factory car, would have a spare tire hump. We don't need that and our chassis kind of got in the way. What we need to do is a little bit of measuring and then we can get to cutting up some metal. With this piece, I want to make it plenty big enough and then come back and trim it down later. What we're looking for is an 8x8 panel with a 2 inch flap. I'm going to use some electric shears to cut it out. Our brake is pretty straightforward. We're looking for a 90 degree bend. Matching the contour of our wheel tub can be somewhat difficult but using some cardboard and a little bit of time makes it much easier. Now we'll just transfer this pattern that we just made to our piece of metal and then cut off the corner. Now to cut this contour, you could use a cut off wheel, but I prefer the body saw. Hold this thing in place, I'll make a few welds, and then we can move on to that big piece. With that tacked into place, now we can make a filler panel for this big hole. So roughly we need to cut us a piece at 29 by 17 inches. 
With another template, we can transfer our pattern to our sheet metal and trim off the excess at the bandsaw. We got our piece all cut out and the next thing we're planning to do is run this thing through the bead roller. That way I can give it some extra added structure. Now to do that, I need to draw on my pattern and then we can get started. Nice thing about doing it this way, it gives you the ability to see your design and give you a map at the bead roller. We're using a half inch die on the inside and a simple step die around the outside. Oh yeah, that's gonna work. To lock this thing into place, I'll use a few plug welds, and then she'll be good to go. Well, that ought to do it. It turned out pretty nice. I still have to do the other side, but it won't be nearly as complicated as this side with that big old two-foot hole. If you have any questions about what you've seen on today's show, go to PowerNationTV.com. Hey folks, welcome back. A little bit earlier, we got the nose all dialed in on our Mustang and it gave it quite a bit of an attitude adjustment. It can see better with all that new lighting and look better with that arrow. Won't be long, this thing's gonna be on the road. Now the task at hand for us today is gonna be removing this vinyl top off of our Buick. We're gonna get rid of some of the trim as well and when we're all said and done, it's gonna make this thing look a whole lot cleaner. You know what, if it was me, I'd be leaving this vinyl top on and leaving it cream. Trust me, man, it's gonna look great. All right, I'll trust you. The first thing we need to do is get this big old trim piece off that goes across here. Now it's tempting to just grab a hammer and a chisel and just start banging away at it, but we don't wanna do that for a couple of reasons. One, you could damage the car itself and we're gonna paint this roof later on, so we wanna avoid that. The other reason is because once you start changing the way this thing is shaped, it might be even harder to get off. You could kink it or even make it clamp down on the clips even tighter. So we wanna make sure we do it the right way. Removing these trim pieces isn't very complicated and using these plastic pry bars makes it even easier. Plus, they're a lot more forgiving than using metal tools. Now here on the skinny trim, it's basically the same procedure that we did to remove this big wide stuff. But if you were trying to save this, it's a good idea to use a pry tool that's got a wider foot. That way you'll run less chance of bending it up. But all we're trying to do is get this stuff off of here. Well, the next thing to take into consideration is gonna be the quarter glass. Depending on the design of the car and the design of the vinyl top, the top could have been installed after the glass or before, which is the case with ours. That means that vinyl sandwiched in between the glass and the body, glass has to get out of the way. Now, good thing is, we're only gonna have to use 10 millimeter socket to get those nuts out, window will just pop right out. Tommy, we catch this glass for me? Sure. It's all yours. We're finally to the point that we get to pull this ugly vinyl off of the roof. And I have a small concern that it may be rather difficult. This top being in such nice shape, it's probably really glued on. And you know, as much as I hate to see this top go, and you know I do, I think this is gonna be my favorite part. Oh yeah, it's really stuck. We're just gonna start at the bottom edges near the corners and work our way up and in. Cause this glue is hard as a rock. Yeah, that's why. And it's harder than it looks. Lift with your legs, they say. I'm not enjoying this as much as I thought I would. I like to see you grind. Looks like I need to use a different knife. You need to borrow my knife? My nature. If I'll slow down, that means he'll do the majority of the work. I hear you. <laughs> but with a little teamwork, we get the majority off in no time. 
All that's left to get the rest of the vinyl off is this trim panel, which is riveted on. My half's done. Time for coffee. And they glued the heck out of that thing. And it just snaps, well, breaks right off. Don't go anywhere as we make the fur fly off our 85 Buick project. Hey folks, welcome back. Well, just before the break, we got the vinyl top off of our Buick, but we're not finished because we've got all this glue left on here and that's gonna be the most tedious part. Yeah, this job isn't any fun by any means. And I have to say, whenever I do something like this, about a quarter of the way through it, I start thinking there's gotta be a faster way. And usually there's not. About the best way that I've found is to use a big sander and just stay after it. And luckily for me right now, is we got two of these big things. And you're ambidextrous. Well, you know, you're right, but I know you just begging to work on this car. I'll Look at that you. face. Look I'll at that face. I promise you he's more excited than that. All right, a couple of safety items before we get started. Number one would have to be your eyes. Make sure you wear safety glasses. There'll be a lot of stuff flying around here. The other thing is gonna be your lungs. You wanna protect them because we don't know what's in this glue and it's gonna be flying all around. All that dust, you don't wanna breathe it in. Now, Tommy's got 36 grit on his. I've got 80 grit on mine and we're really not sure which one's gonna work best on this glue. So we're gonna try them both and go from there. Both of these are getting the job done, but it sure looks like Tommy's is doing it a lot faster. I think I'm gonna go get some 36. Think so? Might bring me in another piece. Got it. We'll just sand away at it one section at a time until all the glue is gone. All right, well, we're almost done, except we've got these holes back here and the studs here. We need to fill the holes, get rid of the studs, and these studs are welded to the roof, so all I need to do is just sand them down. We're just using a 36 grit pad on an air grinder to knock them down. We're gonna have to bodywork this roof later anyway, so they don't have to be perfect. You done making noise over there? Huh? Anyhow, now we're gonna have to fill in these holes on the back side of the roof, and to do that, well, we need to protect this piece of glass. I've got some deflection paper here that I need to install, and it is kind of pricey, but I tell you, you say one piece of glass, it's well worth this paper. This stuff is nice because you just stick it right to the glass, and you trim it to fit. Then we'll prep our holes by grinding away the remaining paint or glue. Well, I got the roof all cleaned up, and while I was doing that grinding, I noticed that a couple of these holes still have a part of the rivet in it. And you gotta get that out because it doesn't really work to fuse aluminum to steel. It's no big deal. With a punch and a hammer, you can knock it right out. We're gonna use our Lincoln Electric Power MIG 210 MP to get the job done, and then grind the welds flat. Well, we took care of a big chore on our Buick today. We got the top off, the holes ground down and welded up. Now we'll have to do some body work, but that'll be a little later down the road. If you have any questions about what you've seen on today's show, go to PowerNationTV.com. Today on Detroit Muscle, we work on the rear of our 85 Buick Project Street Regal, adding a custom fabricated spoiler. Hey y'all, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Today we got some fab work planned, jazzing up the backside of this old Buick. Cause it's a bit bland, you could almost call it vanilla. So now it's time to add some flavor. And if the word Hemi pegs your meter, you're gonna wanna stick around because later on, we're heading over to Arrington Performance to see some friends of ours. They've got a bunch of Hemis there, but they've got one Mopar in particular that we've got special interest in. You'll see what I'm talking about. 
The way we were planning to spice things up is by making us a rear spoiler. Now there's not a whole lot of options out there if you're wanting to buy something. There are a couple of companies that make a reproduction spoiler that would come on a Grand National, but we're looking for more. We want aggressive and tasteful, but not gaudy. The first thing we need to do is make that base plate. We'll start out by measuring our trunk lid. We don't want the base plate to go from edge to edge, so we'll put our plate at 58 inches. You guys have seen us use this thing before. Bam, we have our first plate. Now we can set our panel back on the trunk and a quick measure to center it up. We want to make sure it isn't sitting sideways. We'll trace the bottom of the base plate following the curvature of the trunk lid. Then it's over to the old bandsaw to cut it out. This old thing fits pretty nice here on the curve of the trunk, and I'm wanting to match that same curve here on the leading edge, but that's just preference. You could leave this thing with that straight line. Now to do that, I'm gonna make a couple of marks across here at two inches, and then pull me a line all the way across it. Now to draw this curved line, I'm going to use this back edge as my guide, and you want to make sure that there's no sharp spot on it because it can cut your hand. And then you want to use your hand as kind of a jig to hold the marker. Just lay the marker right on top of your indicated spot, get your fingers comfortable, and then just pull in one fluid motion from one end to the other. We got our base plate all made and the next thing that we need to do is actually attach it to our trunk lid. And the reason I want to do that is I don't have to worry about it wiggling around whenever we're going to add that next piece. Now with that, you could use some tech screws and kind of just zip it to the trunk lid, but we want it to look a lot better than that. So we've got a different plan. What we're wanting to use is some of these blinded rivet nuts. It's a glorified pop rivet with threads on the inside. And I've got a couple of reasons why. If you wanted to use a nut and bolt, trying to get your hand inside of here to put the nut on it, well, it can be rather difficult. And the next reason is, since this thing's got the inner structure, you'd have to hack it up to make an access hole to put the nut on it. We don't want to fool with all that. I'll tape the plate down in place and measure for my six holes. Then we can center punch our crosshairs, drill our pilot holes with an eighth inch bit, and then drill our lid to 2564s. To install one of these inserts, it takes a pretty hefty gun. All you do is thread it onto it, squish the handle, and it will compress it and give you a piece like this. The little rib spots bite into the surface or the hole that you just put it in, and it's very important that the diameter of the hole you just drill matches the diameter of this insert. We use these all the time, and they're silly easy to install. Not to mention, they give you a much more professional look. Last thing on this top plate, we need to enlarge our holes for a quarter inch fastener and we can bolt it down. One piece down, one piece to go. Stay tuned, Tommy adds the finishing touches to our rear spoiler. Hey guys, welcome back. Next thing we're gonna be doing is taking this flat piece of aluminum and building our wing out of it. That's gonna be a little bit more complicated than this piece, and this is why. The deck lid has got a curve to it, the back of the deck lid is curved as well, and we want this thing leaning back. We'll keep everything simple. The first thing we need to do is mark center on both. Now we just need to line up these two center marks and kind of kick it back to the angle we're looking for. 
Now we need to take a couple of measurements here, one on each side to make sure that this thing is parallel with the deck lid because you don't want it higher on one side and lower on the other. Right, that's three eighths. That's dang close. Uh, just, I mean, a sixteenth of an inch up on this side. Stop. All right, that looks good. Well, now we need to make a mark all the way across, but we're not gonna be able to do that right with the Sharpie up against that base because there's a big gap here. It'll only mark there in the middle. So we need to get up off of there, and we're gonna do that with this piece of wood right here. And we'll just use that, and that'll keep it steady all the way across. We just, there you go. There you go. With our line drawn, we can trim this part down. All right, let's see how well this thing fits. Line it up here in the center. Move it around. Oh yeah, that's not too bad. Looks like Mark's fancy pencil work paid off. Let's tape this thing into place, and then we can add some style. We're using just standard old masking tape. Be sure to press it down firmly to help it stick better. To jazz this up, I'm going to map out a little recess. When building something like this, you can get as creative as you want to. That'll work. Not really a fan of this square corner, so what I want to do is kind of roll it off a bit. Now earlier we trimmed off this bottom piece and I'm going to use that to give me that nice line. So what I'm going to do is measure down about a half of an inch, line this up to the corner we marked on there, to this mark here on the edge. Then I can use this to transfer it on that side so everything matches. Nice thing about laying it out this way, if you don't like it, you can simply wipe it off and try something different. While I'm here, I don't like this either, so it's got to go. When fabbing parts, you get to know your bandsaw real well. Now we can smooth out the edges on our trusty belt sander. We got our rear wing all shaped up and it's starting to turn out pretty cool. The next thing we're going to do is tack weld our two pieces together and then I'll take this off, take it over to the table and finish welding it up. We don't want this to move around when we take it off, so we're going to space out our tacks about eight inches or so apart. Since Mark wasn't busy, I got him to help with the fit while we tack it up. A couple more tacks and we can move to the table. To weld this, we're using our precision TIG from Lincoln Electric. A tip for you, when welding long parts like this spoiler, pay attention to how much heat you put in it, because you don't want it to twist or warp on you. Check this out, when we got started, the back side of this Buick had a generic appearance, so we had to do something. With a little bit of fab and some time, we now have that aggressive look that we was going for. Hey y'all, glad you made your way back. We're steadily trying to remove the maw maw effect off of our Buick here, and we're making some pretty decent progress. We got the vinyl top off of it, a custom rear spoiler, and some fancy bumpers for each end. Now this car had a couple of Performance Brothers from back in the day, the Buick Grand National and the GNX. And I'm a big fan of both of those cars, so I want to take some of the body options that they had and add them onto our car. Now one of those modifications is relatively simple, the other one is going to require some cutting. So what we're going to do is install these pieces that we got from Original Parts Group. We've got a full set of fender flares and some side scoops. Now to install these, it's pretty straightforward. They have a bolt-on design, so let's go ahead and get these on and out of the way. We'll start out by removing the chrome trim pieces around the wheel openings and bottom of the quarter. Then we can put our flare into place and clamp it down. These things just screw right to the inner fender well lip and just like that, they're installed. We've got 
got our flares on, now it's time for us to install our louvers. Now to do this, it's not really all that complicated, but it does require us to cut a big old hole here in the side of this fender. Now with the kit, it comes with an instruction sheet that gives you a template of what you're gonna have to trim out. So let's go ahead and cut this out of here and we can get started. For placement on our template, it's supposed to be three quarters of an inch down from this body line and this corner here is supposed to be two inches from this edge. We need to make some measurements and then we can tape it into place. Luckily for us, the lower pinstripe is dead on three quarter, so we just need to mark the back. Now we can place our template on the fender and trace around it. To cut out my hole, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a drill, make me a couple of holes here in all the corners, and then follow that up with my body saw and cut out that piece. Now, whenever you're gonna cut something like this out, you need to keep in mind your tooth count on your blade. You wanna choose the correct blade for the material that you're working on. Now, we're cutting steel, and both of these are for cutting metal, but the one here is 32 tooth count per inch, and this one is a 14. This is really nice for cutting sheet metal because the teeth are so much closer together. With this one here that's far more coarse, if you were to try to use it, you could actually damage the panel. After punching our holes, it's time to let some metal chips fly. Oh, and like your kindergarten teacher told you, stay inside the line. If you were installing these onto a painted car, you wanna come back and touch up this raw edge because you wanna prevent it from rusting. Now with our car, we still gotta do all the paint work and all that stuff, so we're just gonna stick this thing in there to see what it looks like. Oh yeah, it looks pretty cool. Now I just need to do the other side. Coming up, we show you the cure for peekaboo rust. Hey y'all, thanks for hanging with us. We got our louvers and flares on and this Buick's looking pretty killer. A while back, we removed our vinyl top and sanded off all that goo. And up under that top is the seam where the quarter panel and the roof join and they fill it in with some plastic or even lead depending on the age of your car. And whenever we took all that off, I found a pretty common problem. That would be rust up under the filler. What happens is moisture gets under there, it starts to corrode and pushes the filler off. So all this has to come off to see how bad everything is. We gotta get this shiny stuff out of the way. We don't wanna mess it up because we'll be using it later down the road. Grinding time. This is what I was talking about. You can see the evidence of some rust all the way back here, but from the visual that we seen before we started grinding, it was just right in this area. This is exactly why you gotta pull this stuff out to see what's under there. Our 36 grit disc chews right through this old plastic. Don't get crazy here with your air tool and keep the RPMs down. We're just trying to get the filler off not grind holes in the roof. A wire brush does a good job as well, really well in those nooks and crannies. Now with everything all cleaned up, the next step we're gonna do is fully weld both of these joints. Keep in mind that you're welding near a big flat panel, the roof. So spacing out your welds and letting it cool a bit is a good idea. And if you have to do it a couple of times, it's no big deal. Now a quick massage with a grinder, we're ready to move on. With everything welded and prepped, it's time to spread on some filler, smooth it out. On a joint like this, I prefer to use the stronger aluminum reinforced filler. Once it's all mixed up, it can be applied directly to our metal surface. When using filler, make sure to squish it into the seam to minimize the chance of an air pocket. After it hardens, sand with some 36 on a hand block. 
We'll wipe it a second time to get our desired shape and switch to some 80 grit for a smoother finish. Well, that didn't take much effort at all, and it put us one step closer to getting some shiny paint put on Street Regal. If you guys have any questions about what you've seen on today's show, go to PowerNationTV.com. a clean sweep on all of our projects here and we've got a lot of empty space. We rearranged the furniture a little bit and not only that, got it cleaned up real nice. Now with all this empty floor space, there's only one thing you can do with a shop like this and that's fill it up with some new project cars. Here's what I'm thinking. A two door sports car sitting right over here. Maybe lipstick red, something we can take to the track or a 70s Trans Am themed car over there. Then again, we had a lot of fun with that CTS V a while back. Maybe we bring in another four door. Just got so many ideas. I don't know where to start. Shoot, man, you must have forgot about my baby girl. I had it sitting up there on the shelf. Now it's time for us to knock the dust off of and get back on it. Now you would make quite the entrance like this, wouldn't you? Well, it ain't me that made the entrance. It's the car. I thought we put this thing out to pasture. Mm, just on the back shelf, letting it ripen with like fine wine. You know what I'm saying? When I saw Tommy come in the door with the forklift and that Buick sitting on the forks, I couldn't believe it. I mean, that thing had been gone for so long, sat on the back burner, I figured it was sold. Actually, I figured Tommy probably traded it. He does a bunch of wheeling and dealing. Seen him with a new goat, figured that's probably what he traded it for. Now, I know this old Buick isn't necessarily Mark's favorite ride, but we've got to finish this thing, man. You wouldn't believe it, but I like this car. And now that I see it here in the shop, we've actually got quite a bit of work done already. Yeah, we've got the bumpers doctored on, front and rear, or fabbed up a rear spoiler. Plus it's sitting on that trick chassis and the motor and trainees in it. So where do we go from here? What's next? I want to do a bit of plumbing and go ahead and conquer the exhaust. What do you think? Let's do it. On our Buick, I'm wanting the performance benefits of a set of headers. I've ordered a couple sets of Hooker Black Hearts that are for an LS swap, but where everything gets all complicated is with our chassis. The engine's been moved further back and down for better handling, and I sure hope one of these two help us out. Here you go, see if this fits. Oh, long tubes. Yes, sir. We're going to put these on if they will fit in the hole. Look at that custom chassis. You know, you don't really have to know. I don't know if the chassis is going to be the problem. I'm hitting the bell housing right here already. Oh, yeah? Well, before I go any further, is it really hitting pretty? Yeah. Pretty? Yeah, I know it's hitting. Got something else we can try? Yeah, I got some mid links. Let's try that, and if we have to make these fit, we'll make them fit. He's probably going to fit in like butter. Let's see. Oh, look at that. I'm flat up against the head. Yeah, that fits nice too. Yep. You can go anywhere with that thing. Yeah, we'll be able to tuck that pipe a lot closer to the full board. I like that. Well, I guess that made the decision for us. There you go. You gonna polish these, or? Heck no, I ain't polishing them. Mars gonna polish them. I'm not doing it. Well, we've got the header cinched down and now it's time to do some plumbing. Mark's gonna run the pipes from the collector all the way to the back end of the car. And me, I've got a little trick up my sleeve. I'm gonna start with this X that we got from Magnaflow. This is a really good place to start because you figure out where it's gonna fall, and then you can plumb from the headers to the inlet and then from the outlet to the back of the car. But there's one more thing we have to take into consideration with this build. We've got this custom chassis here and it's got the provisions already here for the exhaust pipes to go through. It's great because we can slam this car really low, tuck the exhaust in nice and tight. Drawback is we got to hit that bullseye just perfectly. I've been tinkering with fabbing up a fancy exhaust tip that's going to complement the tail end of our Buick. And this is what I've got so far. What we still need to do is build the inside of the tip and make it so that we can connect it to the tailpipe. What we need to do now is cut off this inside of the bumper. I'm 
I'm gonna cut this piece out so that I can make room for that inner tip. Now I gotta grind all this paint off so I can weld on my piece. With this piece tacked into place, now we're gonna start putting together the inside of it. And I'm making it out of two different pieces, more or less an upper and lower. Once I get it wiggled around into the sweet spot, I'll we'll go ahead and tack it into place. I'm making this stuff out of 18 gauge mild steel because it's heavy enough and yet light enough to work with. Next thing we need to do is determine where we want our tube to come in at on our tip. Now I want it to be far enough back that it gives the tip a lot of depth but at the same time, not so far back that it interferes with my fuel tank. I need to make me a mark and then I can get this bumper off and finish up the project. All right, well, I've got those first pieces of tubing tacked into place on each side and they're really imperative because you need to make sure that it's level and also pointed straight toward the rear of the car but not only that they need to be the same height I've got that accomplished now i can move on to the mid pipe but i've got this piece right here that i found out in the warehouse this is actually an x pipe out of a magnaflow direct fit kit that we had laying around somebody already stole some pieces out of the kit so i took this this is going to be ideal because the spacing on the pipes here are going to go right through those holes in our frame so i'm going to get this mocked up Connect the dots. There we go. We decided to use these V-band clamps from Magnaflow because they're nice and high end and you can remove them and reinstall them as many times as you'd like. All right, I'm just gonna check, make sure this is level with the ground. Looks good. Got the glove. Now with everything mocked up all the way to the X, I can take it all back apart now, start doing some welding. Mark's been making some pretty good progress, plumbing the pipes up under our Buick, and me, well, I've been whittling on some steel and we're ready to weld on the top plate. Got all the welding done on the back side that I could, so I flipped this thing over. We're gonna grind off this excess and then finish welding up everything on the front. Well, I'm at the point now where I need to start building the tubes that go up over the axle, but before I do that, I want to get the mufflers in place, make sure I end up in the right spot. And another thing too, Tommy, I need your input. I want to make sure this muffler position is going to jive with your tip. Yeah, it should be just fine. We'll have to put a 90 on it to connect it, but nothing, nothing too serious. Cool. Well, I can start working my way this way. Will you grab me a pole jack, please? Let's see, I need two 45s. Let's see how this thing looks on here. It's gonna look amazing. It's fancy, I'll tell you that. And it's heavy. <laughs> now with the bumper mounted and adjusted, I can start making my connection between the muffler and the tip. We're using one of Magnaflow's universal kits. What's nice about these is they have all the bins necessary to fabricate this entire exhaust system front to back. Well, now that the muffler's tacked into place, I know it's not going anywhere. I move on and get these tubes built over the axle.
Man, your plumbing work under here looks pretty nice. I appreciate it. Is it up to your standards, though? You don't need to be talking about my standards, buddy. I'll tell you what, the tip looks nice, so I like what you did with that. Well, thanks, man. I know each time we're getting a little closer to hearing this thing roar, and I can't wait. Well, I have to say that was a big win with the charger. And now that that thing's all finished up and gone, we can move on to some other projects like our Buick Regal here. That thing's been on the back burner for a while, but we got the exhaust all plumbed up recently. It's time to move on to the plumbing under the hood. Now we got several systems that we're going to terminate today, like the induction and the cooling. And when we get both of these done, it's going to get us a huge step closer to having this thing on the road. We just got to get a few bolts out of the way here so we can get this intake manifold out. What we're going to be swapping to is this modular mid-rise intake from Holly. It utilizes a dual quad, dual plane base plate, and then with a couple of A adapters, well, it converts it over to an EFI setup. First thing we need to do is install our O-rings on the base. Here you go, boss. Oh, man, look at that. Let me get some hardware. Take. You know, it's not too late to go with a couple of 750 double pumpers on you. Oh, man, that sound pretty sweet. Got a torch spec? Yes, sir. First depth is 50, the next one's 106. All right, thanks. Once that's done, we can set our wrench to 106. With our base plate torqued down, I need to put in our gaskets and then I can put in our mid plate. I'm gonna have to line everything up. It's not very complicated. I say this thing's starting to look pretty cool. Now we need to torque it. Left two. That's it. All right, now we just need to get this O-ring here in the groove. And what's nice about this is it just sits down in the groove and when we put the hat on or the lid to this intake, the clamping force of those bolts holding that thing on is what keep this thing sealed. After I get the gasket in place, now I can drop on the lid. I'll be using a little lube on the bolts and install them by hand before I torque them down for the first time. Well, I just finished the first sequence of 75 inch pounds and I'm gonna go to 130. It's really important to follow the manufacturer's specs on something like this, not just the torque spec, but the torque sequence as well. Another thing you'll notice is they've got the bolts coming in from the bottom. You may wonder why, and that's because Holly's very specific about how they want their product to look, and that's just one small thing they do to make it look nice. The next thing we're going to install is our belt drive system that we got from Summit Racing made by Billet Specialties. Now from where you're sitting, you may be thinking that this is a bit intimidating because there's so many pieces to the puzzle. But in all reality, if you follow the instructions, it's really not all that hard. It comes with a 140 amp polished aluminum alternator and a nice and shiny AC compressor. The first step to getting all this installed is putting on your harmonic balancer. You making any progress, Cuz? Yes, sir. I got that factory water pump and this balancer out of the way just for you. Well, I appreciate that. Now, whenever you're doing something like we are here, swapping out our balancer, one thing you want to keep in mind is you can't reuse your factory bolt. And we're swapping ours out with one from ARP. Well, we've got our belt drive all installed, and now it's time to move on to getting our cooling system mocked up and figuring out what we're going to do for our air intake tube. For our induction system, we went to Summit Racing and got a universal kit that has several different bins, filter, and some brackets in it. So I'm going to grab a couple parts here and we can get started. There's a couple things you want to keep in mind whenever you're plumbing your filter, and that is your filter location. You don't want it so close to the headers or the radiator to pick up excessive heat. And the other one is moisture. Now what I'm thinking I'm going to do is place this thing about right here. That's a good central location. And then run the tube over to our throttle body. I am going to cut out this lower part of our inner fender so that it can give it a little bit more fresh air, but I'm not going to drop the filter so low in there that it can pick up wheel slosh. 
So first thing I think I'm going to do is cut this piece of pipe off about right there so I can slip my filter on. What we're fabbing is kind of a universal setup, but it's technically a cold air kit. And what that refers to is it's pulling a cooler, denser charge from outside the engine bay into the engine. With all that done, the next thing we need to do is locate where we're going to install the boss for our mass airflow sensor. Now there's a few things in our application that we have to keep in mind. One of them is it needs to be 10 inches from the throttle body. As far as the orientation in the tube, it needs to be from horizontal up to vertical. As long as the connector is in that position, you're fine. And also it needs to be in a six inch straight piece. So about right here should do the trick. Tubular man! You're an idiot, brother. What are you doing? Working on taking this thing off so that I can weld it together, make it one piece. Probably gonna need that welder later. All right, I'm gonna leave it on for I'm you. I'm gonna work on radiator hoses. Sure. Now with what he's working on, let me paint a little picture for you. Stroll into a parts store and you tell them what you got. 85 Buick Regal. They're then gonna ask you, what size engine you got? You say 525 horse LS3. They look around at the keyboard, look back at you like you're dumb. Uh, we don't have any upper radiator hoses for that thing. Guess what you got to do? Make your own. And that's where these right here come in. All this stuff we're using is AN-20 that we got from Earl's. And these fittings screw right into the bungs on that aluminum radiator we got from Frostbite. Another reason we're using these is because these are really nice and high end and it's going to match the theme of our build. Now I just need to get these ends here and figure out where they need to go. Well, this all looks like it's gonna work out really well. Just need to loop that lower hose down. We'll get to that later. And this upper hose here is headed in the right direction toward the water pump. But the problem is we've got this end right here that's an AN-20 and the pump itself has this slip on bung for a regular radiator hose. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this little fitting right here and it needs to weld on here and that's gonna solve our problem. But gotta get that water pump off in order to get this welded on. So this entire belt drive system has to get removed. We're going to use our Lincoln Electric Precision TIG. It's great for welding aluminum like our intake tube. Now I need to cut a hole in this tube before I weld the bung on so that the mass airflow can slide into it. Weld, weld, weld. That looks oh, yeah. good. Thank you, sir. Hey, while you're all dressed up fancy, do you mind welding this on here for me? Yeah, I guess if you put that on. Sure. Don't touch it, it's hot. Oh, thanks. Well, we got that bung welded on and I went ahead and reassembled the belt drive and Tommy made us a radiator hold down bracket right there. So now all that's left to do is make some hoses. We're using Earl's Ultra Pro hose and fittings. They're light and designed to withstand harsh environments, vibrations and high flow requirements. Plus, they're quick and easy to assemble. These things will keep our LS3 cool and happy. Man, oh man, aren't you fancy. Oh, thank you. Well, that looks pretty good, too. Well, we gotta have some filtration, you know what I mean. Yep. And I tell you, it sure is nice finally making some progress on this old girl. I know, we're getting close. We can do a fuel system and some ignition and we'll fire this thing up. I think you're putting a cart before the horse on that one, buddy. Yeah, and we ain't even broke the horse yet. Not at all. Hey y'all, today on Detroit Muscle, we're working on our Buick Regal. Now this is a pretty trick car. It's got an aftermarket suspension up under it, LS power, several body mods, and so on and so forth. Now to make a car operate correctly, there's several systems that have to work together. And today we're gonna work on the last few. Yep. One of those, the main one, is gonna be this fuel system. Now, we've actually created some obstacles for ourselves with some of those things that Tommy mentioned before, but that's okay. We're gonna figure out a way to make it work. You like him, Will? Nope. <laughs> Well, 
Well, at a quick glance, you can see what I'm talking about when it comes to hurdles. Nothing under here is original, including that fuel tank that's conspicuously missing. It's because it's not going to fit. We've got a custom chassis, narrowed frame rail so we can get some big wide wheels and tires here. We've got an anti roll bar, then not to mention the exhaust system. These mufflers are in pretty far and Tommy made those fancy tips and that's going to leave us a little bit of room. We need to do some custom fabrication. I think we can make it work. What do you think? Absolutely. So our solution is all these pieces. We got a fuel tank and a several other parts for the filler neck from Summit Racing. We just need to get some dimensions, cut us a giant hole, and we can get started. Basically what I'm doing is making a few marks of where we're going to cut the trunk floor so that I can recess the gas tank down in there. Here's Tommy! Got it. Let's save it just in case I was off a little bit. The reason I built this little framework is to give the floor a little bit more structure and that big gnarly hole looks really raw. This way, it gives it a bit of a trimmed out look. To weld all this up, I'm using our Lincoln Electric 225 Precision TIG. Now, you don't have to use a TIG welder. If you wanted to use a MIG, that'd be just fine. Now, I'll drop the frame into place, secure it with some clamps, tack it in. Now we need to do some fab work here on our tank. Now with it, it's 10 inches tall and I don't want whenever we mount it up, you'll be able to see the thing hanging out from under the car. So I'm gonna take these angle iron brackets and mount them about three inches from the top. That's our sweet spot. Here you go, boss. I'm going to let you put it in. Man, you did all the hard work and you're going to let me do this? I won't admire my work from afar. It looks nice. Yeah, look at that. I mean, it's racy looking, but you got to pop the trunk every time you go to fill it. That's not very classy. Trust me, brother. I got a plan for that as well. Okay. You know Mark's right. Having to pop the trunk to fill up the gas tank is a pain. Even with these cars from the factory having to flip down the license plate, well, that's a pain in the tail as well. So what I'm going to do is take this gas filler neck that we got from Summit Racing and drill a hole in the quarter panel, mount this up, and then build us some tube to fill up the gas tank. It's not all that hard, but we do have to cut a hole in the quarter. With placement of this cap, there's a few things that you want to keep in mind, and one of them is the appearance. You want to make sure that the cap looks like it belongs on the side of the car. And the other one, well, it's that old plumbing rule of thumb. All that stinky stuff rolls downhill. If you mount this cap too low, well, you're going to run into problems with it filling the tank. What I'm thinking is this thing needs to be about right there. That should do it. Since the cap I'm installing has a flat surface and the quarter panel is curved, I've got to build me a little cup, if you will, so that I can mount it. I'm going to use some 20 gauge steel, cut me out a disc, and then wrap some steel around it. Now to weld these two pieces together, I'm going to use my table here, some washers and a bolt, and build myself a jig. And then tack weld this strip and pull it tight all the way around. generic looking cookie cutter. Let's see if it fits. It's a little warm. Oh yeah, that's nice. Burn that dude in. Now from the factory, our old car had the gas filler that was behind the license plate. And that was kind of a pain. The way we're doing this now gives us a much more modern feel and it looks pretty snazzy too. Now it's time to work with the tubing. This next process isn't very complicated at all. We just got to get from this point 
to this point. What I'm gonna be using is some two inch stainless steel tubing that I got from Summit. But what I did run into is this neck here is two and a half, so I went to an exhaust shop and got a little reduction piece. And that solved that problem. Now it's time to figure out what bend I need, cut some stuff up. Looking in here, what I need to do is come out with a 90 pretty tight and drop down this way because what I'd run into is when the trunk closes, this hinge is gonna come down, so I can't really come straight out. Don't be alarmed about running a filler neck like this. Heck, them old Mopars came from the factory this way. Wow, you got that done pretty quick. Yeah, it doesn't take long with you out of the way. That looks <laughs> nice. What are you gonna do to it? You gonna finish it out? Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna paint it, polish it up, or heck, I may even wrap it with some of that exhaust tube and give it a kind of a custom touch. That would look cool. Well, I guess I can work on figuring out what we need to do for a pump. Well, that's good. And I hope you like now that you don't have to pop the trunk to put fuel in it. Yeah, good solution. I should have thought of that. Tanks installed. Now to get that fuel to our 500 plus horsepower plant. Well, we're working on figuring out the fuel system on our Buick, and because we've got that fuel cell, the best thing we figured, we needed an intake pump. So we decided to go with this Holly Sniper Universal Pump. What's cool about this, it's got a 340 liter per hour pump, 600 horse, that'll support way more than we need. But the other thing is, this is a returnless style system, so this is built for that. We just need to figure out where it needs to go, cut the hole, bolt it in. Well, we've got our filler here in the center and it goes up that way, so we want to stay away from the center in this corner. And our cinder's here and the float is over in this area and there's a baffle that goes here and here. So we can't go here or here because there's really not enough room for that port there. So we kind of need to be in this area here. And we really don't want it to one side because if you do take a right turn, it'll starve the pump if it's on this side. So we want to put it in the middle here in front of the filler. And this is a 20 inch tank, so I want to make sure that we mark it right there at 10 to start. And then we want to center it up front to back here as well. That way it fits. And that's about five and a half. So we're gonna go, let's see. That's where we'll drill our hole. We're gonna cut this hole to three and a quarter inches. The reason we drilled that three and a quarter inches is because that's the diameter of the bottom of this hat here. That slides right down into the tank and the top of the tank seals by this piece of foam here. It's this thick because you can use this pump on a corrugated tank like a factory style one. Another thing is once we tighten these bolts up top here, it's gonna flip these tabs out and that's what grips it all together and seals it tight. Well, we've got our pump installed and tight, and I went ahead and installed the two fittings that come off of the pump. One is gonna be the feed, and the other one's gonna be the vent. There is no return, this is a returnless style. So we figured out where we wanna make those go, right through here, under the car, and then we'll route them once we get under there. But instead of drilling three quarter inch hole and just running our hoses through there with a grommet, we wanna make it a little cleaner and safer. And we're gonna do that with this Dash 6 bulkhead fitting. Just need to figure out where we need to drill our holes, drill a couple 916 holes. With our bulkheads tight, we can run the hose from the pump to those bulkheads. I went ahead and made the first one. I'm gonna copy it, and then we'll go get them on the car. Well, we talked about that vent hose, and rather than just plumbing it to the outside in case it does get fuel out of there instead of it contaminating the environment, it's gonna go into this catch can right here that we got from Finch Performance. It's made of billet aluminum, just mounts to the floor here. Need to drill a few holes and bolt it in place. This thing comes with this plate, which is a template here, so you can mark where all your holes need to be drilled and get them right the first time. I'll do it. And with the car in the air, we can finish up our plumbing.
Well, we've got our feed line attached to the bulkhead and that needs to go up to the fuel rail, but there's one thing that needs to go in between and that's gonna be this post filter right here. Pre-filter's built into the pump. Gotta find a safe place to mount this where any suspension components are gonna interfere with it. And we don't want it too close to the exhaust either. I've actually got a good spot. I wanna mount it on the inside of this frame rail right here. But in order to get my tools in there to get it mounted, I need to get this muffler and tube out of the way. So I'm gonna do that next. So, wall man, what kind of progress you been making? Well, I got the hard part done. I just kind of route this hose to the front. Yeah. Uh, just want to get your input on how you wanted to route it. You want to go on top of the frame, side, mm, whatever is easiest and looks, you know, professional at the same time. Okay. So simple and clean. Got it. Yeah. What are you working on? I got to go grab some of the electronics so that you know we can start doing all that business, and I'm not looking forward to that. We're gonna fire it up today. Hope we don't catch it on fire today. Take that as a no. We start wiring up the connecting crews and install that skinny pedal. All right. Well, we terminated the plumbing for our fuel system here at the rails and that's all done. We just need to wire up that pump. In fact, we need to wire up pretty much everything on this car because we haven't touched it at all, have we, Tommy? No, we haven't. And whenever you're doing an LS SWAT like we're doing with the Buick, this part right here is the most intimidating. You've got all these little connections, and sometimes you don't know which ones go where. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a bunch of spaghetti. I can understand why people find that intimidating. Mm, yeah, for sure, man. But what's nice about the setup we went with is they've simplified it a whole lot. This is a full standalone harness from Chevrolet Performance. It's got a fuse box, your ECU, your electronic throttle pedal, and all the connections you're gonna need to make that engine run. All you gotta do is terminate a few of these loose ends and the rest of it's plug and play. Well, this is simple. I mean, they make this thing to just go in anything, right? Absolutely. You could even put it in a Ford to make it worth something. I hear you. So where are we starting? I guess we probably need to start putting all this in. Ooh. See why it looks intimidating, don't you? Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing we need to do is kind of plug in a few of these things and see where we can put that main fuse box and such. I see some injectors here. I wonder if that's for this side. Mm. Let's see if we can find the engine coolant temp sensor, because I know that's over here. All right, well, this is for the throttle body, so it looks like we need to flip it. This is, there's your mass airflow or nothing. Oh yeah. Just takes a minute. Getting somewhere. Oh, got one plugged in. One down, 3,700 to go. B46. Bingo. There's your math. Hey, hey, you don't be talking about my math. Wait like for you to pick a fight. An oxygen sensor. So this whole harness right here needs to go through the firewall. I guess we need to figure out where and how. Well, I talked about this harness that needs to run into the car, and rather than just drilling a big hole here, I want to utilize an existing one, and I found the perfect spot here. This is the Speedo cable. We're not going to be using that anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and take it out. I think that hole will work. So many things in the way. Why did I choose that hole? Oh yeah. Let's try the big one first. It's gonna be this OBD2 port. Oh yeah. All right, let's get the next one. That's gonna be the pedal. Barely. But it goes. Well, in this harness that I pulled through, we've got the data link connector for the OBD2 port one wire that goes to the ignition switch and one for your check engine light, and this one that goes to the pedal, which is basically just a sensor, but we gotta get it mounted to the firewall. In a good safe place, we can get full wide open throttle. Let's take a look. Stud there. Go right there. Gotta space that off though. Yeah, that'll do it. Measured from the spacers. Be in good shape. 
Paul Mark's up under the dash mounting that gas pedal. I'm going to work on mounting up the ECU and our fuse block. Now with this type of setup, man, sometimes it's really difficult to make this stuff look like it belongs. And that's the challenge that we're going to have. So it looks like I'm going to have to fab up some brackets. I'll cut up some three quarter inch thin wall tubing and a couple of pieces of 18 gauge mild steel. Fab this thing up. It's that simple. A couple of basic brackets and that stuff looks like it belongs in there. Well, I got this pedal assembly all figured out. Had to make some little pedestals here. There's not a flat spot on this firewall, but Got it all figured out now, just need to get it bolted in, I'll be done. Oh yeah. All right, it's good to go. Tommy fabricates a custom steering shaft. Now, I would imagine from your point of view, you were thinking we were making some really good progress on the Buick, and I just backed up about 10 steps taking that front cap off. Well, the reason I did is because spending a few minutes removing that sure does make my tummy a whole lot happier working on this steering and not having to bend over that fender. Now, we've got a destination that we're going to hit today, but we've got a few hurdles, but that's just a stone for a stepper. So what we've got to do is connect this point here, the shaft coming out of our steering column, to this little shaft down here coming out of the rack. And the obstacles we have to avoid is the motor mount and all these header tubes. And after studying it just for a bit, I noticed if I was to shorten this shaft up and move it back, that'd give me some room around this header. That's what we're going to do. Now where I just lobbed off the end of that shaft is a little bit crooked. How I'm going to true it up is going to be pretty primitive, but it's going to be effective. I'm going to spin the steering wheel, causing that shaft to rotate, take my grinder, touch the end of it, it's going to true it up. With all our pieces cleaned up, we're ready to weld them back together. Now to help assist this, I'm using an old drop, a piece of three-quarter double D. I'm going to slide this old piece onto there and then slide all this into the steering column. It'll help keep everything nice and straight and give us a backing for our weld. With that piece tacked on, now it's time for us to make all these parts work together. What I like to do is have several different U-joints and a few different lengths of the shafts and then start installing them. The car itself will tell you what will work and what won't. Now, you may have to start over and regroup a couple of times, but you got to stay true to it and eventually you'll figure it out. Now this old car has been sitting around for a while and finally getting back on it was well, putting a smile on my face. Yeah, a few of these things are quite difficult, but actually I enjoy them the most because it allows me to be creative and show my craft. And when you're all said and done, being able to put your stamp on saying, yeah, I created that and being proud, well, that's a compliment all in its own. Well, we got our shafts and the joints all figured out. And the next thing we're going to have to install is some shaft supports because otherwise these are going to flex around and it's not going to work properly. It's not that big a deal, but it's time to do some more fab work. After bolting my bracket on here, I'm going to twist that shaft around and put it at the sweet spot. We'll probably have to trim it off and we can weld that dude into place. Well, you got that steering done? Because you make it sound like that's the only thing I worked on today. No, we got a lot done. That wiring harness, which wasn't too bad actually. Mm -hmm. The entire fuel system's wrapped up. And I got the pedal installed, which reminds me, I need to go to the chiropractor. Yeah, that was a rough one for me too. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, but I mean, in all reality, if we put in another serious day, maybe a day and a half or so, we may be riding in this thing. I think we could do it. I'm ready, man. It's been a while, and I want to hear that exhaust anyway. Uh, I tell you, though, I got a little flat. I'm going to have to fix it and put a plug in it or something. I hope we don't have to roll on those. Dude, they're pretty awesome. Call these one-offs because one fell off. This week on Detroit Muscle, we jump back on our Buick, buttoning up our power steering components, and we add a high performance brake kit. Well, we're finally making some serious progress on our Buick Regal project. This thing's been around for a while. It went away and came back a few times, but it's back to stay until it's completely done. Now you'll notice right off the bat, it's gray. It's not beige anymore. That's because we've done the majority of the body work and got it in primer. As a matter of fact, we've got some other panels over in the prep booth Tommy's working on, but that's for later. Today, we got some systems that need to get buttoned up on this car before we do paint it and send the chassis off to be primed while we're still in the mock-up stages here. We've got to address the brake system. We haven't touched that yet. We've got to install a transmission cooler. We've got a couple of other little things, including the power steer steering system, which I need to mount this remote reservoir, get the hoses made. I'm going to do that now. First thing I need to do, though, is get these fittings into the steering rack. They're adapters to AN, then I can make the hoses. The next thing I'm going to do is mount this power steering reservoir, but I went ahead and put the air intake in place so I knew where it was and I didn't want to interfere with it when I mounted this. And I have to mount this tube higher than the return on the pump itself. So the best place I can find is going to be right here inside this inner fender. I have to grind down this little lip to make it smooth so the reservoir will mount flat against the inner fender. Then we can mark where we want the bracket to be. All right, those are exactly three inches apart, and the one is half inch from the edge. Using our measurements, we can mark our holes, make sure it's level, and start drilling them out. I'm done with this. Then we can bolt it up and start making our hoses. Yes, sir. When making hoses, you want to make sure you use the high pressure hose. We cut the ends flush. That way, the fittings are nice and tight. These hoses are under a lot of pressure, so you don't want them leaking or rupturing. Well, I finished up the hoses, got those installed for the power steering system, so that's all done. I'm going to move on to the brake system. Let's start with what's on the car. We've got a brake pedal assembly. We're going to retain that. We're also going to retain this factory brake booster. The diaphragm's good, so we're just going to build out from there. And we're going to do that with all the stuff that we've got here on the table that we got from Willwood. We're going to start in the front here. We've got this big brake kit for C5 and C6 Corvettes. This is a direct bolt-on. It's perfect for us because our chassis came with C5, C6 spindles, so that's gonna be a nice and easy install. As for the rear, this is kind of a universal kit for four to nine inch equipped cars, so it's very popular for street rods and muscle cars. It's got big rotors and calipers just like the front, but the difference is this has got a parking brake assembly, so that's super nice and easy to install. As for the master, we spec this one out to go directly into our factory brake booster, so it's gonna be just perfect. We do need to plumb it up a little bit with this proportioning valve. I'm gonna get that assembled here, get this thing bench bled. We'll get this thing on the car. 
After getting our master cylinder bled and assembled, we'll mount it to our brake booster. All right, with that installed, now we can move on and install the rest of our brake system. We'll show you what to check for when adding a custom brake kit. Plus, we install our transmission cooler. Well, I finished up in the prep booth and I got Mark out of the way, so I went ahead and assembled our rotors. I got them torqued to spec and set with some thread locker. Now we just need to go ahead and finish putting all this good stuff on. Before you start slapping on all these cool parts, you want to make sure to do some inspecting first. And all of them have something to do with making sure this rotor fits on the hub correctly. Now, if you were using some used parts here, oftentimes there's rust and corrosion here on the surface. You want to clean that off to make sure that that rotor's nice and true on there. Another one is this knurl on the stud. Sometimes whenever it pushes through, it's a little bit too fat and it runs into the back side of the hole. Another thing is the radius of this stub sticking through. Make sure that that doesn't have any interference with this spot here. Let's see where we're at. Get it lined up. Well, we're good to go. So now we can put the caliper on. I'm gonna slide on a couple of washers and screw on some of these lug nuts. That helps to prevent me from dropping this rotor. I hate to bounce it off the floor. Plus, it also helps with setup. It keeps that rotor nice and tight against the hub. So it's nice and true. I'm gonna twist this thing around and give me a little more room. Now, if we were assembling this for the last time, we put thread locker on these bolts. But since we're still in the mock-up stage and we still gotta paint everything, we're just gonna put it together. Now I'm gonna use this top bolt to keep that thing from falling in the floor. Slide this other bolt in. Slide my shim up from the bottom. Go ahead and get that one started. Putting that bolt in from the top keeps you from having to use three arms. Now I'm going to take this one back out. Put that shim in from the top. Now there's no real big need to really crank down on this stuff. Just get it good and snug because we're still in setup. This caliper has a few adjustments that you have to do properly if you want your brakes to work correctly. You can see that this caliper is too far this way by the gap being wider on this side versus that one. So we need to take a few of them shims out, move everything back that way. The next thing you need to do is make sure that the placement of the pad on the rotor surface is correct. What you want is with that caliper pushed all the way down that the top of the pad and the top of the rotor are flush. We're good in that department. So all we gotta do is take out a couple of shims and we'll be good to go. And yeah, that did the trick. Now we're almost off the subject of brakes, but we got a little bit more plumbing to do. Well, one of the things we talked about doing today is going to be the transmission cooler, and that's what we got right here from B&M. We also got a bunch of fittings and hose from Earl's, including these special fittings right here that adapt to the transmission to AN-6. First things first, I'm going to get this transmission cooler mounted, and we'll go from there. Let's see where this is going to go. Uh, I like that. You can reuse that hole and that one. I'm going to drill one right here. We need to mount this thing in front of where the condenser is going to go so it can go right in front of the radiator support right here. Looks like we can just use some existing holes and bolt it right to the radiator support. Because of the way this radiator support is stamped, we need to use some spacers to make this cooler stand off a little bit so we can mount it flat. All right, now we just need to connect the lines. All right, that's it for that. Now we can move on to something else. We're pretty much ready to go ahead and install our starter on our old Buick here to finish mocking up the wiring. If you've got a starter that's giving you a fit, maybe you need to check out Duralast Gold Starters. 
Each one is engineered to deliver a torque output that meets or exceeds OEM specs. Not to mention they're all built using new components that are triple tested to ensure quality and performance to meet the highest standard. So if you're in need of a starter and want to ensure the maximum life and performance, you may want to check out Duralast Gold at AutoZone. Well, we've gotten quite a bit accomplished today, but there's one more task I want to do before we blow this thing apart and send the chassis off to be powder coated and get the body painted, and that's going to be measure for our drive shaft. So a few things you want to make sure you take care of before you get this measurement. One is going to be your drive line angle, will be the tilt of the engine and transmission, but then also get the rear end where it needs to be as far as pinion angle goes and then at ride height. But since we don't have our wheels and tires yet, we can't get this thing on the four post. Second best thing is going to be to put a couple of pole jacks under here, get it up at ride height and get your measurement there. So that's what we're going to do. The starting point for our measurement is going to be the end of the tail shaft housing here, but that's where that seal rides, that machine surface there is where we need to measure from. And there's not enough area because that seal covers it, so we need to figure out the thickness of that metal seal first. That way we can add that to our measurement. Looks like about 45 thousandths. Well with that done now, that makes it a lot easier because I can put my measuring tape right on the face of that seal. And I get my measurement for the length. Put that right on the face, and back here to the center of the bore of the cap for the U-joint. Looks like 51 and 15 sixteenths. All right, now we just need to add those numbers. All right, 15 sixteenths is 9375. So we've got 51, 9375, that's our measurement, plus our 0.045, the thickness of our seal, and that's our length, 519825. All right, with that done, we only need a few more pieces of information to get our drive shaft ordered. One is gonna be the spline count on our output shaft, ours is 27. The other one's gonna be which U-joint we need for the rear, and this is a 1350 style. If you don't know what yours is, you can take a couple of measurements, and that's gonna be the overall diameter of the U-joint, and then the diameter of the cap, and that'll tell you which U-joint you have. The only other thing, and this is kind of important, is going to be your power output level because you want to make sure you have a drive shaft that's strong enough. You think they need that drive shaft length down to the ten thousandths? Uh, you got to get pretty close. We got a lot accomplished, didn't we? Absolutely. But are you talking about today? No, I mean since the beginning. This old Buick has come a long way since we started. To say that this thing looked like it could be your grandmother's ride wasn't too far of a stretch. At first glance, the Meemaw colored paint might turn you off, but we knew this ride had potential. First thing to do was go on a bit of a road trip to Street Ride Garage to get fitted for a new frame. They worked their magic and built one trick piece. Our frame now is a full custom setup with adjustable coilover suspension all the way around. Some big old fancy sway bars on the front and back, and a rack and pinion steering setup. These are just a few of the upgrades that our chassis has to take our Buick to the next level. We picked the 525 horsepower Chevrolet Performance Connecting Cruise. After getting it dropped on the chassis, it was time to marry the body to the frame. With so much performance on the bottom side of our Buick, we had to make a few adjustments to the appearance to bring it up to speed. I've always been a big fan of the Grand National, so with a little bit of slicing and dicing, we now have side scoops that the Buicks are known for. Then we had to address those big old bulky bumpers, so some fab work was in order to doll them up. The tail end was begging for some attention as well, so with a couple of pieces of aluminum and a welder, you could say we adjusted our backside appeal. Heck, we didn't even talk about the mechanical stuff. Yeah, let's not get into all that, but I can say the next time y'all see this, it'll be time for a color change. Change back to beige? Probably, you know, I like that color, it looks pretty good. Today on Detroit Muscle, we take Grandma's old beige Buick and give it a splash of color. Plus, we get our chassis back from the powder coaters and start assembling the suspension to get it rolling. You know, I have to say, I do love this color you picked out. That battleship gray really pops. You know, for you to be such a small man, you sure can cast some pretty big stones there, boss. You know, yeah, I would clear it if I, if I was you. 
No, sir. I've got a fancy color picked, and this thing is going to look killer. I believe that. You know, it's taken quite a bit of work to get here, but I am I'm sure am excited to see this thing finished up. Oh, yeah. I mean, it really has. You know, I mean, mini tubs, full chassis, LS, connecting crews, 525 horse. I mean, this car is complete transformation from where we started. Yeah, but that's not the work I'm talking about. I'm talking about all the sanding, blocking, and dough work, all that. Luckily for me, I found a friend of mine, you know, that doesn't mind wiping the sweat off his brow and gets a little dirty, puts in some effort. Yeah, I hear you. Well, everybody wants to be the trigger man when it comes to painting, but you can't spray a car straight. It comes from hours and hours of sanding. Now, you don't want to just invite anybody to come over and help you. You're not trying to remove a refrigerator and all you need is a strong back and weak mind. This type of situation, you need some skilled hands. Now Michael back there, he's a really good friend of mine. I've known him for quite a while, about 20 years or so. And there's a few things that I know on him and there's a few things he knows on me, but we don't ever tell nobody. Unless it's us when we're drinking and you know, it's kind of bragging rights. <laughs> Yeah, I know some dirt on him. He knows some on me. We've been in some stuff together. I guess that happens when you know somebody for that long. Once the Buick was whipped into shape, it was time for a coat of primer, and Street Regal was ready for some color. You know, I admire all that body work, but you have to admit, you're not the only one that's put a bunch of time on this thing. What have you done? Well, I got the chassis all torn down and taken off to the shop to get blasted and powder coated. I got you. And judging by the colors you picked, it's kind of hard for me to tell what color you're going to paint the body. So what is it? Man, I've got a red from Summit Racing that's going to knock your socks off. Summit Racing paint like we used on uh, Sidewinder? Yeah, it's basically the same material, but the techniques on the application is slightly different. No rollers and brushes. No, it's far more traditional, if you will. You could say we took an out-of-the-box approach with our Fox Bodies paint job. We called in our old friend Ted Swan with Summit Racing to help with the distressed look we were going for. He gave us some tips and hints on how to pull off a cool, yet weathered patina paint job on Sidewinder. Now, I know that's just a bit unorthodox, but it turned out when we were all said and done, and your ears have probably been burning. They have been lately. Uh... A lot of people have actually asked how we ever got together, and uh, it's a rather remarkable thing that we've done multiple projects over the past couple of years. So, uh, I guess it's time to paint your Buick project now. Oh, absolutely, man. We're ready to... No, 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 no. Don't get excited. We're not doing the paint brushes I love it. I and need rollers that. again. <laughs> I really needed that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, this one is going to be far more traditional. We're going to paint this in all shiny and that on-fire red from Summit. You know what? That's a really nice color. I mean, that's got that deep, lustrous, almost burgundy, slightly candy apple look to it. And we're going full shine this time, correct? Mm-hmm, yep. Uh, several coats of clear. I want this thing to look deep. Ah, uh, this is going to look real deep. We're, we're going to put some overall use clear on this thing so that, uh, you know, we don't run out of reco time and we can wait a little bit longer between coats. Now, I know Summit's got several other colors. Do you have any hand in picking those things out? Believe it or not, no. Uh, that was one of them things that they picked on our own with some of the colorists. Actually, what they thought was going to be popular and timeless. And some of the colors are actually updates on some of the very popular older colors i mean you know colors like the solid color boss blue or the go bananas are like brightened up and slightly toned down of classics that like our parents or grandparents might have had the bahama blue metallic real nice classic color but it's going to fit appropriately on anything from a harley davidson custom bike to uh, uh somebody's resto mod 63 corvette I know some people may accidentally look at those colors and say, yeah, they look good, but maybe a bit concerned because they're so economically based. But that's really not nothing to be worried about, is it? No, it's nothing to be worried about. One of the most expensive things that any car paint manufacturer does is constantly chase the factory to factory variations that occur with the same color code. I mean, oftentimes, if you read an engineering magazine, you'll see the term backed. It's best available current technology. When they build a brand new factory, they may have some brand new, more transfer efficiency. In other words, more that comes out of the machine actually stays on the car, so it's better for the environment. But they do have variation from factory to factory. I mean, you can see this if you've ever gone to a modern salvage yard 
after you broke a gas cap off your car, you find one, wow, it's the same color, and you bolt it on, and you realize how different it is. You know, it could have been as simple as a factory in Georgia versus a factory in Detroit or maybe even another country because cars are made all over the world today. So you don't have to worry about matching colors when you've got something like this palette. You pick the color that you like, and that helps save a lot of money. Is that what you're saying? It saves a lot of money because you make it one time, it's consistent from can to can, and more importantly, it's going to give you that consistency to the customer. They buy some more later, and they're going to have a very accurate rendition, regardless of what the era was that they bought the paint in. Now, I know with Summit, it's pretty much the go-to whenever you're going to be looking for go-fast parts. But even with the paint side of things, that isn't just one thing they cover. They carry everything else that you need to paint this car as well, don't they? Yeah, you better believe it. I mean, Summit Racing has a complete selection of products, going from the preparation of the surfaces to body filler to sandpaper, uh, degreasers all the way up through and including clear coats and polishes. Like on this Buick, a lot of people sometimes think, wow, why doesn't my car look like that? Like a Rolls Royce say, and they don't realize the amount of finishing time that goes into a car like that, where it's color sanded, compounded, and then polished you know, to get that almost texture-free look to it with zero particles in there. I mean, that's a lot of detail work and hand work once the job is done. And it obviously gives you a spray job that's sometimes smoother and cleaner than maybe a regular production automobile would have. Well, we're pretty much all cleaned up and ready to start mixing and spraying. You gonna be around so you can touch in with us? I am. I want to see that thing when you get done the base coat. All right. We'll holler back at you. Thanks. Give me a go. Coming up, Grandma's Blah Beige is gone. Street Regal's in the booth, and it's time for some color. Well, our Buick's ready for its transformation, and I'm so excited. We've been working on this old Buick for quite a while, and one thing I'm glad to see going away is this Marl Marl colored paint job. Whew, yuck. I'll be spraying on a coat of sealer before we add on our color, and this process will help the paint adhere to the surface and gives us a uniform canvas for us to work with. Not everybody enjoys painting, but this is a point whenever you're building a ride that your vehicle makes the biggest transformation. They usually go from ugly and primered up to shiny and full of color. Now I really enjoy spraying red colored paint, and it's not because red is my most favorite color, it's actually because that was the first color I got to spray. I was about six or seven years old and my old man was painting one of his trucks and he was painting it Victory GM Red. And after seeing him paint his truck, well, I wanted to paint my toy truck. So I asked him, can I use that paint gun? And he said, you gotta tape the windows up first. He handed me a roll of masking tape. So I scurried around there trying to get the windows mask up. And after that, he gave me the paint gun and I went to spray it. You could say I painted everything in a three foot radius from that toy truck grass, rocks, probably even a bug or two. But when I was done, man, I was smiling. So you could say that was a moment in time that ignited the fire for me building cool cars. And I've come a long way. This one looks a whole lot better than my first one. Hey, Tad, just wanted to give you an update. I don't know oh, if you can cool. see what's going on back here. I'll flip you around so you can see it, okay? Yeah, it'd be great. Got some color on it. Tommy's spraying away, what do you think? I think it looks awesome. I mean, the color looks great, and, uh, you know, paint is fully disassembled. It's going to make for a beautiful job when it's done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Tommy, Tommy's been hard at it. I think I'm going to go break away here and go get him a snack and uh, give him a break for a little bit. We'll get back to you after a while, okay? See you in a bit. Take uh, care. All right, thanks, Ted. You bet. 
you're digging the way that old Buick's turning out, well, you're probably gonna like this next step. We've got all the color on, and now it's time to spray on some shiny. For clear, we're using Summit Racing's High Solids Urethane Clear. We're looking to apply three coats onto our Buick. Now, some people say it's a little bit tricky to spray on clear coat, but really the trick behind it is to see where you're spraying it. So sometimes you have to maneuver yourself around to catch the light just right to see where it's going. Other than that, just keep moving, keep spraying. With our Buick, we're painting it with Summit's Base Coat Clear Coat system. The base coat has to be top coated because otherwise it doesn't have any kind of UV protection and the paint itself or the color will just weather itself away. So the clear coat itself doesn't only make it shiny, it protects the color. One common problem that happens whenever you're doing some painting is getting trash onto the surface. One tip for you is try not to be all flailing around with your arms causing this big commotion. Just smooth and steady movements. Hey, big man, I had to give you a call back to show off my handiwork. I got the clear on, and it turned out pretty nice. Check that out. It, it sure did. I'm looking at the reflections, the lights, I mean, the logo, the air control unit. It looks perfectly wet right now. It looks great. Yeah, we're going to do a little buffing a little later on, so I might give you a ring if you if you answer. Of course I'll answer. <laughs> that looks fantastic, though. That's going to make it even nicer. Well, thanks, man. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get off here. I need to get the gun and all cleaned up. So we'll be hollering at you here shortly. Take care, you guys. Blasted and powder coated, our chassis is back and we start installing our suspension. Getting Street Regal one step closer to rolling. Well, as we mentioned earlier, Tommy's been getting the outside of the Buick looking all nice, and I've been working underneath with the chassis. And as you can see here, Got this nice shiny gold finish and I think it turned out amazing. But believe me when I tell you it didn't look this nice not that long ago. We sure like looking at that fancy fab work that Street Rod Garage did on our custom chassis, but it's time to coat it in some shiny. So we brought it to Blast from the Past in Lebanon, Tennessee. We've used them before on several projects and they do an amazing job, whether it's sandblasting or powder coating. Now our brand new chassis collected some rust over the time while we were building the car, so it needed to be blasted just like anything else would. Once it was down to bare metal, it goes in the booth. The guys have to make sure that all the media is removed before the powder coating process starts, so they blow it off with some compressed air. The next step is to apply the powder. For our Buick's chassis, we chose this gold color. We think it'll really accent that red nicely. After the powder is applied, it goes into the oven where it bakes at over 400 degrees for up to 30 minutes. Well, while that frame was in the oven baking, they took some of our other suspension components to get them coated, like our control arms and spindles. On our suspension components, we decided to go with a couple of different accent colors. We picked the traditional black for some components, and others we decided to go with this gunmetal gray. And those suspension parts turned out really nice and I like the way they work with that gold frame. Speaking of the frame, it was time for it to come out of the oven, but we weren't really satisfied with that semi-gloss finish, so it needed to go back in the booth. Now this next part is a little unconventional. Normally powder coating gets one coat and then baked and it's done, but we're doing something special on our frame. I know this powder looks white, but it's actually a clear coat. Once it gets baked in the oven, it's gonna come out shiny gold. As powder coating becomes more and more popular, some of the coatings get more involved, like adding a clear coat. What's nice about this is it gives you a finish like a base coat clear coat paint would with the additional benefit of being more durable. I'm really glad we decided to go with that gloss clear because it made that gold pop, especially when the light hits it. We even had them do the control arms while they were at it. Now I just need to get the rest of this thing assembled and hopefully by the end of the day today, this thing's gonna be on the ground. Now when you're working on assembling something that's been powder coated, you wanna make sure you take your time because you don't wanna chip the coating. It's really hard to touch that stuff up. We're using ARP stainless steel bolts on this project where we can. Gotta make sure you put some anti-seize on there, keep them from galling. And one thing I like to do when I have something that's freshly powder coated like this is to get all the powder coating off of the holes where the bolt needs to go through is I use this little abrasive here on a drill. That way I don't take too much material off. It's pretty handy. 
Another thing I'm doing here is I'm reassembling everything in the exact opposite order of which I disassembled it. And I even took some photos before I took it all apart so I knew how it looked when it was all together. Stuff only goes on one way, it's nice and easy. Just need to get the bolts installed, get them cinched down, and we'll be ready to get this thing on the ground. It's amazing how much nicer these components look once they're all powder coated and put back together. It's really cool the way the colors play off of each other. Well, I'm gonna go grab some wheels and tires and this thing is gonna be a roller, finally. Don't go away. We take our new paint to the next level. Well, we got our Buick all sprayed and it turned out really nice. And you know, we can't just leave things alone. So we're gonna do a step now that can be a little bit labor intensive, but when we're all said and done, it's gonna take that paint job to a whole nother level. What I've done, still a little bit of sand in here on the fender for this demonstration. As usual, we got a few pieces of trash in the paint, so we wanted to sand those slick as well as the rest of the panel. So using some 1000 grit and some water, that did the trick. Now, a few of you probably are a little bit concerned about that dull finish, but don't worry about it. We're gonna make it a whole lot better. The first thing we're gonna do is use some Ultimate Cut from Sonax with their hybrid wool pad here. And don't you worry about it. There weren't any psychedelic sheep harmed in the manufacturing of this. What's nice about both of these products is they're designed to save you effort and time. All we need here is a few drops to get us started. We're ready to go to work. And we're only buffing a portion of our fender to get started. Ultimate Cut is a fast cutting compound that quickly removes thousand grit or finer sanding marks from the paint and has an odorless water-based formula that keeps the dust to a minimum and uses no silicone. Heck yeah, that was nice. Cutting and buffing is a pretty serious process, but if your ride's reflection is just faded or weather beaten, it will help bring back its original shine. Man, that looks nice, and that's just the first step. Now, for a few of you out there, you're probably thinking, it's pretty much done, we should stop right there. Well, we're only halfway through the process, and I'm sure you've seen a few other people that have stopped midway through because you've been at the stoplight or at the car wash or something, and the car drives by, and there looks like swirls all down the side of the car. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Kind of looks like a hologram effect, and that's where they didn't carry the paint till its full potential. And this next step will take care of all that. Just a little bit of this stuff, and it'll make you some happy paint. Now for our last step, we're using Sonax Perfect Finish with their green polishing pad. Perfect Finish was developed to repair paint defects like trash and paint runs after sanding. It starts off with an initial deep cut and then diminishes to produce a high gloss finish taking care of all the holograms left behind by our first step. Let's see how good this looks. Man, yeah, won't nobody be making fun of your ride. If anything, they'll be a bit envious of it. Oh yeah. Now with the paint that we started with, it looks pretty nice, but after a little bit of rubbing and some Sonax polish, it took this paint job to a whole nother league. 
Well, today has been a pretty big day. We got all the color sprayed on the Buick. The chassis is fully assembled and in color, and this thing is looking pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about it. And I gotta tell you, as far as the color choices go, the frame and the body, great job. Appreciate it, man. I tell you, I can't hardly wait to be behind the wheel of this thing, stretching it out on an open road. It's yeah. gonna be a sweet day, man. Won't be long, yeah. And uh, the real question is, though, who's gonna buy the root beers? Heck, I'll buy the first round. Second round. If we're celebrating, I might be even going as far as four rounds. Wow. I got coupons. Today on Detroit Muscle, we get Street Riggle in the shop for a final push before sending it to the upholstery shop. We'll give you some tips on painting different types of metal and the right way to install door glass and trim. Hey everybody, welcome to Detroit Muscle. We're back on our 80s Buick Regal project and I'm excited about that because this thing is getting really close to being finished. You know the popularity of the mid 80s GMs, the G bodies is pretty much through the roof and I'm okay with that because they've got a sweet spot in my heart. Yeah, and I know you paint me as a Ford guy, but I love the, especially the Buick version of the G bodies. There's just something about them and it may just be our generation. So we wanted to take this car and set the bar with it. And I think we did that full chassis, LS3 connecting crews, big brakes, big wheels, the list goes on and on. But my favorite part of this build would have to be that shiny red paint that Tommy sprayed on. Now we did have to massage the body just a bit to get the reflection that we've got. And you know, we've come a long ways. With our solid foundation set, it was finally time for us to start assembling all of our shiny pieces. Now usually this is the most fun part of the stage of building a car because the car is starting to take shape. But one thing is for sure, you have to be careful. You don't want to damage all your hard work. Well the next big thing on this car is going to be obviously the interior, but before we can drop this thing at the interior shop to get that done, we got to put all the glass in it, especially this door glass here, because you got to have that on before you can put the door panels on. You know, plus we're also knocking down all that bright work, the shiny chrome. So I've got a few pieces I need to paint. I guess I need to go get in the booth. All right, well, I'm gonna go dig out that door glass and the other stuff if you didn't break it. Well, I can't promise nothing. Well, I got my first round of parts here in the booth. They're all prepped out and we're pretty much ready to start spraying. Now, I've got three different situations set up in here, and you may run into these if you're planning to do some painting yourself. First, let's talk about this hood. The primer that is on here is the EDP coating. It's electronically deposited primer. Now, they put this stuff on here to cut down on corrosion and to prep it out. Well, pretty much all you have to do is clean it first, scuff it, and then re-clean it, and you're ready to start spraying. Now, back here on the spoiler, it's a little bit different. The primer that's on our spoiler is something we sprayed on here at the shop, and I've got two different types. The first round was a polyester. That's this orange or pumpkin colored stuff that you can see coming through. And after I sanded that real well, I came back and sprayed some urethane on it to smooth out my scratches. Now, when I started sanding on it, I got a little bit thin with that urethane, so to paint this piece, I'm gonna have to seal it to go on to the paint process. Last but not least are these two pieces of trim that we've got hung up. Now you've probably heard war stories of people trying to paint chrome and not having much success. And more than likely what they did was just take paint, spray the chrome, and it didn't stick. So what really needs to happen is you need to spray on a tie coat like this epoxy primer that I've already applied. And the reason for that is because the adhesion properties of the primer is much more significant than of paint. Now I need to mix up some sealer for my spoiler back there, and then we can spray on that black. Mm -hmm. 
Now we've all heard of metallic colors settling in the can. Well, really and truthfully, flat and semi-gloss colors do the same thing. So it's crucial that the color is mixed thoroughly. So putting it on a paint shaker is the optimal way to mix this stuff up. Now you can do it with a stick, but it just takes longer to do. And if you wind up not mixing it enough, well, what you'll run into is whenever you apply the color, there'll be shiny and dull spots and a real inconsistent reflection. So make sure you mix it correctly. With our paint off the shaker, it's time to get to spraying. What we're using is Summit Racing Single Stage Hot Rod Satin Black. Now with spraying this stuff, I'm going to put on about two coats. All of them's going to have about a 50% overlap and make sure that you select the right reducer for whatever temperature you're spraying. Sometimes with these trim pieces, it can be a little tricky to make sure you get all the nooks and crannies. Pay attention, but you don't want to come out of here and have missed a spot. Now for this spoiler, it turned out pretty slick considering all this was flat metal just a while back. Well, that laid out pretty nice. We just need to let it dry and cure out so that we can handle it, and then we can put it on the car. Coming up, we dive into installing glass and window trim the right way. Well, while Tommy's been working on getting those pieces painted, I've been busy getting this side assembled with some of the stuff we painted earlier. And I have to say, choosing to paint that trim black was the wise choice. Really love the way it makes the red pop. But when you're doing stuff like this, getting the doors assembled and the glass in it, it can be quite tedious. And there's actually a certain process you have to do to get it all assembled properly. And I'm gonna show you how to do that on the other side. Well, I mentioned there's a process and there's a reason you have to do things in a certain order, especially when we're talking about assembling doors. That's because if you put one thing on before it's supposed to, you won't be able to get to the part before it to install it. For instance, if you get the glass in, you won't be able to get to the hardware to install the exterior door handle or the lock cylinder or the mirror. So I went ahead and got those installed. Now the next thing would be normally to install this outer felt or dew wipe, some people call it. But on this particular car, there's actually a trim piece that goes on with that. So if you just put the felt on without the trim, you'll have to go back and grab the trim and put it on with it. And let's just say, learn my lesson on the other side on that one. Well, now this door is ready for some glass. Well, when we took the car apart, we saved our original door glass and we've decided to reuse it because it's in good shape and Factory glass is a better quality than an aftermarket piece would be, and not to mention has all the hardware already attached to it, so that saves time. The only thing really wrong with this is it's dirty and it had some tint on it, and when I peeled it off, it left all the adhesive behind, so we need to get that off, get it cleaned up, and then we can get this glass in the door. I'm gonna use the glass cleaner as a lubricant to help my blade slide across the glass without scratching it. Another reason is because the glass cleaner kind of liquefies the glue, turns it into like a gel, so it's easier to remove. I want to get this while it's still wet. Otherwise that glue will re-adhere. If you try to scrape it dry, the glue just tends to smear and doesn't come up as easily. Well, that's pretty much all there is to getting that glue off of there. But for the other side, well, we're gonna need a different tool for that. On the outside here, if you look at the part of the glass that was never exposed to the outside elements, it was just kind of hidden in the door over the years. It collected all this dirt and grime that washed down off of the windows. As for the part that was exposed, well, it picks up all kinds of contaminants and it feels really rough and regular paper towel and glass cleaner won't get that off. Well, I'm gonna be using glass cleaner and double lot steel wool instead of the blade. I know that seems crazy, like you're gonna scratch the glass with this, but actually you're not going to. Just like when you clean chrome with steel wool, it's gonna clean the glass the same way. Here, I'll show you. I'm saving this bottom part, the really grimy part for the end, because I don't wanna drag all of that up on the glass that's gonna be exposed. That's better than new. This thing's ready to go in the car. Start up front here.
One nice thing about these guides is that when Tommy disassembled the car, he marked where they were originally. And that way when we're putting it back together, we can start there even if we have to adjust, get a good starting point. All right, let's check this. Yeah, that looks good. I'm gonna go get that quarter glass. Well, now it's time to move on to our quarter glass. And as you can see from the exterior here, it's in really good shape. As far as the interior goes, I went ahead and cleaned the tint and the glue off. But if you look at the butyl here, it's kind of beat up. We could probably salvage that and form new peaks and it would reseal just fine. But it's probably a good idea to go ahead and replace that. We've already got the glass out, the car's real nice. And this stuff's not really that expensive anyway. You can get it at your local parts store. This is 5 16 thick and then we've got 3 8 as well. And it looks like this was probably 5 16 from the factory. So really all we need to do is just get this cleaned up and off of there, get the new stuff on, get it installed. Now it looks like it'd be hard to remove, but it's actually pretty easy. Just gotta work it a little bit at a time. That was a good time to clean any of this up off the edge here. Well, I'm cutting off a couple of little pieces here that I'm actually gonna put around those studs so water doesn't get in through the stud holes into the car. All right, now we can get this thing in the car. Well, that's all there is to that. Now we do have a few more things we need to do and we've got our glass guy coming to put a new windshield and back glass in it here shortly. But after that, we can ship it off to the upholstery shop. Now this goes to show you, if you take your time, do things in the right order, you'll end up with a nice product. And I'm happy with how this one turned out. Today on Detroit Muscle, we have some tips and tricks for wiring up your project. And we'll show you an easy way to reduce heat and noise in your car. Hey everybody, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Now when you get into the end of a project, it can be very exciting, but it can also be somewhat intimidating and time consuming because you get to the point where you're starting to do all those tedious processes. Like recently we got our doors assembled, we put the glass and the hardware in, and even though it's not very exciting per se, it is very important when you're building your car to do each thing in the right order and to do it properly and take your time. So. The next thing we need to do on this is going to be the wiring. And instead of just digging in and showing you how to terminate the specific ends on this car, I'm actually going to broaden it a little bit, take a step back and talk about wiring in general because it's something we don't normally dig into here. Now there's a lot of tools to the trade and some tools are better than others. And then there's a lot of different components that you can pick for a certain process. Then you have to actually make the termination. So we're going to go through all of those today. I sure hope you got that wiring done because uh, I don't want to do it. Yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah. No, I just got a couple of loose ends and this thing will be all done. Loose ends? You've been fighting loose ends for a while, ain't you? You're talking about the car or the wiring? Uh, over to the interior. On a different note, well, we're getting dangerously close to having our Buick all finished up and the next big step is going to be shipping it out to the upholstery shop. Now, with this thing from the beginning, I wanted it to perform well, look good, and be comfortable. So this next thing that we're going to be doing is essential in that comfort department. We all know with older cars and hot rides, they're plagued with a common problem of being hot, noisy, and rattly on the inside. Now, a way to reduce those unwanted factors is by applying some additional thermal and sound control material. We use this stuff on several of our projects and it's pretty simple to install. All you have to do is pull off the backing, smash it onto the panel, and you're good to go. Now this stuff drastically reduces road noise and if you've got a stereo system and you like to listen to it cranked up to 11, 
Well, that's going to cut down on those vibrations. Then there are products that have to be applied using a spray gun. Now, with the application of these, it's a little bit more involved because you got to have a few more tools like a compressor and so on. Now, with this particular product, you just need to make sure that it's mixed thoroughly before you go to spraying and the surface that you're applying it on is nice and clean. Before I go to spraying, I like to mask off the stud or the hole where my seat's going to mount and also where the seat belt mounts. Now, spending a little bit of time here will save you a bit more time on the back side. If you do happen to get a little bit spray crazy and get out on, let's say, the rocker or something, you can clean that up with just warm water and a rag. We got everything cleaned up. I'm going to mask off that shifter, grab my air hose, and we can get to spraying. You should do it. We're going to be applying two different materials. The first one is for sound control. You just want to lay it out nice and even and then let it flash. The second one is a thermal coating. Now it's time to spray on our ceramic insulation. The application is basically the same. Now I like using this type of stuff here on the inside of the door panels for a couple of reasons. One of them, well, since it has a big void here on opening, this type of stuff, you can put it over top of it and it works really nice. And I got a demonstration for you. That's what it sounds like now. that easy and check this out this old door sounds a whole lot more solid now we picked up both of these products at summit racing just in case they tickled your fancy and you'd like them for your ride we still got to let our floor coating dry which is no big deal and then our big bad buick will be off to the upholstery shop Today is the day. Street Regal is finally complete. We head to M&M Hot Rod Interiors as they put the final touches on our one-of-a-kind interior. Then we put all our hard work to the test on the track and the streets, making sure our Buick checks off all the right boxes. y'all welcome to Detroit Muscle today is gonna be one great day we're headed down to M&M Hot Rod Interiors to pick up our Buick we dropped it off a while back and I got a phone call just recently saying that the thing was pretty much ready for us to come check it out and drag it back home now they have done some work for us in the past and what they did well they knocked it out of the park so with that said I can't wait to check our Buick out Hey, wild man, you left the door unlocked, so I made my way in here. Yeah, I know. Sometimes we mess up and do that. Is this, this our stuff? Yep, this is it. You got anything completed yet? Yeah, absolutely. We got one seat finished. One seat. Can I take a look at it? Sure. Where's it at? Sitting on the table. Man, this is one trick piece, bud. Well, thank you, Tommy. Glad you like it. Man, how much time you got in on this thing? Oh, probably a day, day and a half. Now, to build this, does it take a whole lot of different material to do it? Well, we start out with clear plastic to get the patterns, mm -hmm. and, and you really need to do that on one of these that's got all the multiple pieces. Mm -hmm. And so that way you get everything fitting right, and it sews up good, and so that and some foam and different textures of leather. Now, with the foam, did you have to re-foam this entire seat? The inserts are all new. Uh, the sides, we just steam the old foam, and it kind of plumps it back up and then we glue a quarter inch scrim over it mm -hmm. with the scrim side out to make the cover slide on easier. Okay. Because these are kind of tough to get the covers mm -hmm. on. Now I notice with the leather there's a couple different ones here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used a smooth dark brown 
and just for contrast because I don't know these cars need a little contrast and then we used a perforated insert which is a lot like the light model cars the, mm -hmm. the perforated leather will breathe mm -hmm. and you don't sweat as much I got you is it a little more stretchy too mm, it's a little more stretchy because of all the little needle holes and it, it it is a little more pliable than say this leather okay now I see the the rivets here and this is kind of a trendy thing is that very complicated to do nah not hard at all you want me to show you absolutely let's do it now with part of this laid out here it doesn't look all that complicated but that seat well that's a little different story yeah it looks a little different when you just get the insert ready mm -hmm. but we got this one stitched up and it's ready to put the grommets in do we have to cut the hole first mm -hmm. yep got to punch a hole now with your spacing is there anything particular like a rule of thumb or anything just depends on the seat and the width of the insert the way the inserts laid out these ended up being three and a half inches and so then i center the grommet three and a half inches in between there all right but you could do it if it's a four inch or even a two inch what we need to do to get started then we need to punch some holes and to make those nice uniform holes he's using a specialized hole punch after a few taps of the hammer you got perfection that's all there is to it What's this big hunk of metal you got? Just a special grommet setting tool. Right. And they make different sizes for different size grommets. So I've got several. And then you do it bottom side up. Can you damage the material putting this on there? Nah, not really. Not as, you do, as long as you don't miss. Mm. How do you know whenever it's Pressed all the way. Just a couple of licks with a hammer, and that's all you got. That yeah, looks nice. Silly question, hmm? but do you have any idea where them things came from? The grommets? Yeah. Like where they originated? What was the purpose for them? Just to breathe and hold. All it is. Mm -hmm. They used to put them on the bottom of boat seat cushions and furniture cushions mm -hmm. to let air escape. Hmm. Now people are using them for stylistic purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the coolness factor. Mm -hmm. And there we go. You make it look too easy. Ah, nothing to it. Coming up, we button up Street Regal's luxurious interior. Our interior's turning out killer, and just like those fancy seats, our door panels are fancy as well. Now, Jeremy told me that fabbing up this stuff isn't as complicated as it looks. He's working on that driver's side. Let's check him out. So, Wild Man, what do you got going on here? Well, we've got your driver's door panel here, and we're about ready to laminate the second pa panel onto the first one. How did you get to this point? Well, we drew out the design, we cut our panels apart, and then we went ahead and glued this panel on just because that's easier, foamed it, and then we've got the leather covered on it already. Alrighty. So what's your next step? Next step is we're going to bond this one to this one. We're going to put the pins in these holes and go straight down with it. And we'll press it down really well just to make sure that the panels stick together good. Now we're going to press our edges down so that when we glue our other panel on, it's nice and flat. With the leather smoothed out now on the panel, what we're going to do is we're going to glue the top panel on. And we need to go ahead and spray the glue on both sides. How much glue are you putting on? Just a thin layer. You just want a good even coat not too thick or not too wet so that it takes forever to dry. Now when we spray the glue on this panel, I'm going to try not to get any on the foam because we don't want the foam to stick before it needs to. Now we're going to come back and brush glue along all the edges. That's basically because it's more controlled? Yes, you've got a lot more control over, over it with a brush. 
Figure while you would be brushing, you'd at least have your pinkies out, you know. Well, that would make me look more fancy. Pinstripers do it. Now, if you got that a little excessive and it run off to the edge, can you get that off? You can. You can use 3M cleaner to clean the glue off. When you spread that on there, how long do you have to wait? It'll be about 10 to 15 minutes. Just enough time for it to tack up so you can stick them together. Or now that we've let the glue set up on the panels, we're going to stick the two panels together. Now with the top panel glued on, we're going to fold leather and the foam back and spray glue on the back side of the foam and on the top cap. Now we need, just need to give that a few minutes to dry and then we'll stick it together. With our glue dry, now we'll just smooth out our foam. Now we just need to take a razor blade and trim away all the excess. Now with our foam glued and trimmed, you can kind of see the unevenness on the panel. What we're gonna do now is take our sanding block, our sandpaper, and just sand that down and try to do away with this dip. All right, Tommy, with our foam sanded, all we gotta do is spray glue on the foam and the leather and then fold the leather over and finish the panel. Once that dries, we'll finish the panel. All right, now we're ready to apply our leather. On the outside looking in, it looks like for a creative person, this would be an amazing job. Oh yeah, you pretty much got freedom on all your designs and everything. You know, Sometimes we work with renderings, but a lot of time it's just whatever we come up with. With that smoothed down, all that's left to do is turn it over and finish it on the back side. All right, that's it. All that's left is to put it on the car. Man, I can't wait to see it. All right, and that's ready to go. M&M took our Buick to the next level. She now has a full custom upholstery with high-end Douglas leather. They showed off their skills by using multiple textures, rivets, and pleats to give us an aggressive interior, while yet keeping it refined to complement our Buick by selecting the perfect color combinations accompanied with pure Craftsman style stitching. The only thing we have to do now is go enjoy our creation out on the pavement. The journey has been long, but worth it. We'll take Street Regal to the track and lay down some rubber. Well, we are here at NCM Motorsports Park because this is where this car was built to perform, right, Tommy? Not exactly. We built this car over the course of many moons, and I tell you, having it out of here on a day like today is going to be a great day. Well, we built Sidewinder to battle this thing, and uh, unfortunately, that car's long gone now, and I uh, had a nice trip out to Tulsa with that car, had a lot of fun. And even though this car is really kind of focused more for the street, that's the name, Street Regal. I think even you will be surprised at what this thing can do out here. Man, absolutely. This car's got the right combo under it. Big brakes, nice suspension, plenty of power up under the hood. And I tell you, Mark, keys are in it. I'm gonna let you do the honors. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. Don't break her. I'll try not to. You can abuse her, but don't break her. Now, a few of you guys are probably curious why I gave the keys away to Mark so easily. Well, Mark's a friend of mine, and he's pulled a lot of hours putting that car together right there beside me. And you know, out here on the track, I know that's really where he shines. So heck, sometimes you just gotta give good things away. Wow, this thing is super flat. Wow, this thing actually likes it out here. Ha! Well, the first thing I noticed, lots of power and lots of grip too. A lot of lateral grip, big meats in the back, plenty of grip in the front, plenty of braking, lots of braking. You know, being that this thing is a Buick Regal, a grandma's car essentially, you know, it, 
a little odd, especially with this steering wheel and being an automatic, it's slightly awkward. It's just not your normal track car. And I know this isn't a track car and Tommy will argue that's not what it was built for, but this thing's plenty capable. You know, it's like kind of got an identity crisis to me because you know, it's a street car, but it's, it's capable of doing anything you ask of it out here. Uh, its limits are, well, kind of what I can do. I can't really upshift and downshift very easily because it's an automatic, so limited there. Um, as much lateral grip as it has, I'm finding myself holding myself in the car, in the seat, with the steering wheel, with my grip on the steering wheel. So I'm finding myself putting less input in or taking the turns a little more slowly because I just I can't stay in the seat. And it's actually kind of fun. It's awesome. Coming down the straight now. Easily surpassing 100. All the gauges are happy. I'm happy. I'm not sure, but this old Buick may have converted you. What do you think? No, I think we converted it. Oh, that's that's a given. From where I was at up there, man, this thing looked great. The 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 complaint I have, I mean, it needs harnesses. You know, if it had a stick, but I understand that's not what not this what we car was for. built for, right? Right, right. But if I had to blame it, to blame something on it, it'd be that. But you know, that's our fault. Yeah, yeah, we I didn't do it for that. Uh, the only other thing is it almost like has an identity crisis. So it's like acceleration, plenty of acceleration, hard acceleration, all the power you want. But then again, when you're not under hard acceleration, it's like it's comfortable and it's quiet. And it's like it's like it's trying to be two different things at the same time. And it's not doing either one of those really poorly. So it's a cruiser and it's a potential racer if it had those few components. But again, it's not what it was built to do. Right, right. This car here for me per se, I just wanted it to perform really well, but I didn't want to sacrifice any comforts or even the appeal of it by going fast. You know what I'm saying? Mission accomplished. Man. The suspension, the brakes, I mean the handling and the acceleration, I mean everything under the car is like all there. Good deal. All well, there. Sounds like we did all right then. Sounds like we did all right. So good I know, job. I Hand it to you. I have to say, man, up in that crow's and ass, seeing this thing rip around, it was quite the sight. This thing looks darn good ripping. You do it. Man. See what I'm talking about. I bet you run up all the fuel in this thing. Think, Let's see what it is. Uh, what is a gas gauge? I think it's got an eighth tank. You ran it out of gas. Oh. It don't have an eighth of a tank. It has. That's why you wanted me to drive it. You want me to fill it back up? You Make sure you put guy. premium in it. As its name implies, we take our Buick to the street to see how regal it really is. Now, getting out here on these back roads and stretching this thing out is definitely putting a smile on my face. We've been working on this car for a long time. We went through the suspension. We've done paint and body work on it had the interior redone. Basically, this car has been touched from the front bumper to the back. And you know that itself is quite the undertaking. A key component of building a car that performs well going, stopping, turning, and all is having a solid foundation. So whenever we went with the street rod garage chassis, well, we knew we had knocked it out of the park. Whenever you're putting together a ride, one thing that I can't stress enough is picking the right color because this is what everyone sees and you see. If you don't pick the right color every time you see the car, well, it can leave you a little bit disheartened. Where this color that we picked is deep cherry red, very tasteful. It's almost making my mouth water already. Now, Mark was pretty complimentary of the Buick when he was out there beating on the thing at the track, saying that it performed really nice. Now, for me, a track car is okay, but the sweet spot is having a ride that you can take to the track and stretch out here on the highway. Now, with that connecting cruise that we put up under the hood of this thing, 
the power level on it is 525 horse. And that's almost like the perfect number. It's got plenty of pep, it's got a lot of manners to it, and if you want to get a little rowdy, well, that's as easy as smashing on the gas pedal. Some people call it spirited driving. I just kind of call it goofing off. It ain't no line, this old girl a rock and roll. Put a car together like this, it's pretty easy to have a good time. Sometimes I question myself, did I pick like the right occupation? And I have to say, yes. Because sometimes it just seems like your project will consume you because you're putting all your spare time, spare money into it. And sometimes it seems like you're not really getting that far. But finally, you get over that threshold and you complete it. And this car here, yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. nice thing about being out here in the sticks is plenty of places to do a big pro mod burnout. That wasn't too bad. Wasn't even trying hard. Phew! All that smoke blowing around. That's a sign that this thing's plenty peppy. Guess you can say this Buick's got all the goods. Looks, performance, ride, comfort, home run. Well, I sure am glad you didn't crash my baby out there on the racetrack. Well, I appreciate that, but where I was, there weren't any traffic laws to break. Yeah, I could probably say I stretched them out a little bit, but you know, it was fun, but. You know, now it's time to wrap this thing up. Right, so we've got to wrap up the project, but as you can also see, we've wrapped the car with this car cover that we got from Covercraft. This is their most luxurious indoor car cover called the Form Fit. It's made with polyester and spandex on the outside and 100% cotton sheared to a fleece finish on the inside. It's breathable, washable, protects against minor garage dings, and even comes with a four-year warranty. You can even add yourself a bit of a custom touch like we did with a logo. And my favorite part about it is all these covers are made right here in the USA. And this thing's been a lot of fun. I know, man. I can't believe it's finally done. So finally.